Hello, everyone. Welcome back to You Thought You Knew, the podcast where we talk about survivor players that may be underrated, underappreciated, or just misunderstood. Each episode, we try to answer a question that's designed to make us challenge our preconceived notions about a famous survivor contestant. Of course, there are no right answers. It's just an excuse to talk about our favorite show. I'm Nigel Bocanegra, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin McLean. Yes, uh, excited to be here. We're talking about uh, a Survivor fan favorite, and I also think we could do it with an RHAP fan favorite. So this is like, uh, this is an exciting time. Yes, uh, and what a treat today. We are joined by the Mike Bloom. Mike, how are you? I am fantastic. I am so happy that you did that entire introduction to the concept of your podcast before I came on here, because I was about to ask, what in the Nickelodeon is going on here? <laughs> but now... I don't need to change the channel to any defunct kids networks. I can stay right here right now. It's kind of like Avatar The Last Airbender where we get Katara giving us a brief summary of what to expect going into it. So I think uh, it's a nice refresher. Yeah, it's, it's a good recap. Just in case anyone forgets or there's any any new people and mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have to worry about Nickelodeon or how successful they're being lately. <laughs> And uh, Kevin, you know, we are talking about the fan favorite James Clement today. Would you like to get us kicked off with the lovely talking with T-Bird intro? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, the gravedigger James Clement electrified the audiences with his gentle giant persona and his enormous biceps. There's no denying he was a popular icon of the show. He's the only one of three contestants to win the fan favorite award twice, and he was the first one to do it consecutively. But why was James so popular? In a show with a catchphrase of outwit, outplay, outlast, he did lack in multiple categories. He even dubbed himself as one of the dumbest survivors of all time. He had never won an individual immunity challenge in all three of his seasons. And his social game often lacked when he had to work with outspoken and confident women. He was a flawed player after all, but maybe that is why he was beloved. You thought you knew James Clement? Well, we think we do. And on this episode of You Thought You Knew, we will be answering the question, is James the ultimate fan favorite? Oh, that was beautiful. I feel like I was watching 60 Minutes with the, <laughs> <laughs> like the cadence in your voice was beautiful. Yeah, you know, it's 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 like, you know, sometimes you want to be talking about hard news and you talk about James Clement, but I want the feeling to be the same. Yeah, from hard news to rock hard abs. <laughs> yes. So, Mike, to before we even dive in on James, what do you think makes a fan favorite on Survivor? Oh, man. <laughs> this is a particularly loaded question because so much has changed about the fan base within the past 20 plus years for many reasons. We have gone from hate letters to hate emails to hate tweets and now whatever ends up coming next hate threads hate x i'm not entirely sure but the method that people use to talk about the show has now become more and more publicized especially with the advent of influencers and the ability for people to really capitalize on their success during and after the show not to say that didn't happen before hell colby donaldson attempted an acting career from it, but I do think it's distinctly different nowadays. And so I love the question because I feel like there are things that carry through and others that don't. Listen, gaining a unanimous amount of support from any community in the world, less so the reality TV community, is an exercise in failure. But I think if you're talking about what makes a fan favorite is some sort of standout character some sort of standout player and standout i refer to from an airtime perspective though certainly certain factions of the internet love our under the radar rob g dot odysseys uh or the people that like you know get voted out second but are absolutely fire on social media nowadays we certainly have them in the corners but i do think if we're talking about a fan favorite that applies to the larger sense of the community uniting all the platforms and even some who don't use those platforms it's almost always some sort of personality that has a major or largely supporting role in the season. They're almost always going to be an underdog at some point, but overall, they're just a person who garners positive feelings from the people that are watching it. It could be their personal story from back at home. It could be the way they talk in confessionals. It could be the game that they play for good or for bad, but whatever it is, it makes them stand out enough in a way that for the first, you know, 
27 seasons of the show, or should I say, I guess from seasons 12 to 27, garnered cars and or money. And nowadays garners money as well as a shout out from an international <laughs> Australian musical artist. Yeah, I mean, I think a great way to kind of frame that. I think you hit a lot of the notes. I, I, you know, when I think about who or what makes a fan favorite, obviously it's the people that like the fans like in the most simplistic terms. But, you know, it's like there is certain commonalities I feel like you can see amongst the people who tend to be the fan favorite or the larger fan base's fan favorite. And, you know, to borrow like RuPaul's Drag Race's like terminology, I think it's someone who has charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent, right? <laughs> like it is char charismatic. This person probably has a, a decent amount of confessionals or at least memorable ones, like things that like they're, we follow their story through their eyes and they make us like them. You know, there's something that they do that makes us like them. Uniqueness. Uh, quite often they stand out from the rest of the cast. I mean, if you're choosing to vote for them, that means they have to be really recognizable. And not just from recognizable by super fans like some of us, but like my dad who barely remembers anyone's name a second mm -hmm. after the season ends. So who stands out physically, socially, vocally, any of those things helps. Nerve, I think actually an underrated quality of the fan favorite is someone that will take a risk of some sort, interact in some way. Quite often, I feel like they'll have a negative relationship with the season's chief antagonist in some way. So they either get one over on them, they either try to knock them down a peg, or they're being targeted by them. There's something about that that allows us to want to stand up for them or defend them in some way based on their attitude, behavior, and choices. So I say nerve there. And then talent, quite often, I think they should be good at something on Survivor, right? Like it's, you know, I think quite often it's going to be someone who is great at camp life or good at challenges. That's a common one, but it can also be someone who's really good at the game. You know, someone that really impresses us with their natural ability on screen. And I think those are some of the major categories I think about when you think about who the fan favorite award is alongside with just understanding what the American electorate is. So yeah. if you understand that, that, that section of things, you can also see, uh, it's it's kind of I think easier to peg who might have been the fan favorite in a season or or doing a wolf blitzer um, breaking news we have enough to project who we think the fan favorite is based <laughs> yeah, on I've, these other metrics. I've seen enough I'm calling it now <laughs> Rupert wins America's favorite tribal council <laughs> exactly and what I would do for there to be an electoral college explanation of the fan favorite award every like we were going to call Maryland for you know ex contestant you know based on the fan favorite voting but unfortunately it's just it's, it's no longer happens, but I, I, it's like a fun thing to do. And I'm glad Sia has taken it on as something, you know, worth championing. Giving it yes. a second life, <laughs> yes. right? Well, th that's the thing is that as, as odd as it is to now think about how the entire electorate of one country has now been transitioned into the hands of a woman who for the vast majority of the, her career did not show her face to the public is such an odd reality bending type of thing. But I think if you also follow along with the people who have gotten money from Sia, and that's the other interesting thing as well, is that it just depends how charitable Sia is or like how much it pings on her radar. There were some seasons in between when she first gave the money to Ty and when she started giving money to Donathan and Ghost Island where she didn't give money to anybody. Sorry to people in seasons 33 through 35. You weren't getting anything extra from anybody outside of the show proper. But I do feel like by and large, the people that she is giving it to do ring a little bit true to that criteria that, that you and me were talking about, Kevin, this idea of like, these are people who are usually playing major parts in the season, usually have some sort of positive association with their story, whether it be through their background or through their gameplay proper. And they, you know, have to ping on her radar in some way. I mean, even people like Ryan Madrano, who I don't know if any of us would look like look at and say like, oh, this is someone who would definitely win a fan favorite vote in 43. Maybe we'll talk about that later. He had enough of a story that even though he was voted out like four episodes before the finale, it still was enough to ruminate on this woman's mind. And so I do think it's interesting to see that despite it becoming so siloed and so unilateral that it's now in the hands of one person to dole out sacks of fat cash at the end of every season to the point where now we expect it as fans i do still think she is a fan at the end of the day this is not a random assortment she's oftentimes incorporating criteria that we have assigned to that batch of people james two times over and what's kind of fun in the concept of the fan favorite award being given entirely to a random person who watches the show. It's also coming directly from her bank account, right? This is not a CBS one person decision. It is one fan giving away her own money to people that she thinks 
should be rewarded in some way. And I think one reason none of us complain about it that much is quite often she rewards people that we want to see be rewarded to an extent, right? That's like, it's like nice. Like who doesn't want to see the people we love and we like and, um, uh, you know, be rewarded with a cash, you know, from someone who's obviously very wealthy herself with with a, a, an award that will help them in their lives. And what I wanted to say also to this is, you know, Sia's like, I think her objective and her analysis quite often is very similar to a lot of, the, we'll say the casual fans, which is that she likes, again, someone who's memorable, someone who is quite often nice, likable, quite often an underdog that also puts maybe a certain value system above the game. I feel like that's a really common one. And that's something that also I think affects fans, right? Right? You know, we're, we're going to get into James very soon, but, you know, James is seen as someone who, you know, talks about ethics a lot in the game, you know, about what is right for him to do, you know, his his, de his decisions to be a really strong provider, are all about those things that I think resonate with people who don't really care about the minutia of the strategic game as much. And I think sometimes um, uh, thinking through that lens is helpful in figuring out who might be fan favorites. And, you know, before we jump into James, I just wanted to share that uh on the night of the Korong finale, I had to start the episode pretty late, so I was not able to get through the reunion, so I just watched the episode itself. I see that Michelle wins, and I knew that it was something that could have been coming, but I still, in my heart, mm -hmm. felt like it was going to be Aubrey, so I went on to Reddit to see what the discourse was, and as I'm reading through, I'm like, why do people keep mentioning Sia giving someone money. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. I thought it was just this like weird internet meme that we were like all in on. So then when I went to go watch the actual reunion the next day and it happened, I was like, I still thought it was a joke. I, I actually wasn't <laughs> expecting Sia to pop up here. So it's very maybe, fever dream. Yeah. yeah, I think Sia crashing the Korong reunion in early 2016 was maybe the first time for us that we were living in this simulation that has led us in so many yes. different directions since then of like, yeah, that's a little odd. Okay, can I get back to my own timeline, please, where pop stars don't storm the stage of a live finale? Listen, I know Jeff has given a lot of reasons why he likes to do the live after show following the vote reveal. I think low-key, maybe he doesn't want any more celebrities just absolutely waylaying the entire procedure. It's a tight amount of time. He's got to get it in and out in 35 minutes before the news starts. I think see a crashing things and be like, wait a minute, everybody. I have money for time. <laughs> Very much threw everybody off, both in, on, and behind the screen. Yeah, it's so interesting because... You know, I feel like if you think about if Survivor was like a country or a political system, which it kind of is, I guess, you know, since there's a democracy that exists, um, is that the fan favorite award used to be a kind of populist, egalitarian. We, the fans, we had the power, right? We could vote for these people. And then years later, our democracy is destroyed. We don't get to vote anymore. We don't get to decide anything. We, mm -hmm. we Maybe we get a way wow. more cast Wow, Survivor decision. invented voter suppression. Exactly. <laughs> then... It now a, a powerful billionaire, and obviously she is not a billionaire, but she's a wealthy individual who's now she's in, giving away all this money. <laughs> exactly, she is now the person who's like laterally making decisions, you know, unilaterally making decisions for the fan base about who should be kind of promoted in, and then production takes away her power as well by not giving her the time on the actual like stage anymore. I don't know. It's just these are thoughts I'm having right now. It's a, it's a wild, surreal thing to think about. And that this is one of like the lone aspects of Survivor that has carried over into the new era is interesting. I do feel like as Survivor fans, do we have to like keep consciously supporting whatever Sia puts out there? Because the more her pockets are filled, the more likely she will give cash away to our fan favorites. This is an excellent point, Mike. I think that it is our duty as Survivor fans to continue to support Sia in the belief that it's just a roundabout way of funneling money to our favorites from Survivor. It's giving money laundering. Yeah, <laughs> she's the middle person. She's the one that's cleaning the money and giving it out. So we're essentially, to your point, Kevin, despite the fact that perhaps, again, our voices have been distilled, I don't know, maybe at the end of the day, we are the ones that have the voice. It's we're the ones that are giving the money to Sia to hopefully give the money to the people we like. You know, it's it's very feudal lord. Uh, <laughs> the money keeps coming up. She protects us. She supports us. She's very benevolent, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and, and honestly, I think more pop stars should be more aristocratic like her and give more money out. And in fact, I think we should like hear more why no one else is deciding to gift Survivor players more money. Who um who was it that came up with the um the Tyler Perry Super, Tyler Perry? Thank you so much. Yes. Where, why isn't Tyler Perry giving out money? 
Well, this is interesting because there's, and maybe this is uh, me doing some research for a future podcast, maybe not, but there is a hefty amount of celebrity Survivor fans. Where's the Jimmy Fallon cash? This dude is rolling in it prior to the strikes. He is like one of the most tenured late night hosts out there. He was the one that famously created the idea for the Robin, Sandra, Statler, and Waldorf booth from Island mm. of the Idols. Why is it he just handing out the thank you notes and the cash every single season? I'm not sure. Maybe they felt, okay, C is doing it. So that takes a load off of our shoulders. That is a good point. And then it's also like, what if it becomes like, they, they don't tend to support the same people that Sia does. And now we have this like disparate understanding of like what the fan favorite award is. Maybe Sia needs to relinquish her power. Maybe she's like an entrenched incumbent that won't get out of office. And mm. she needs to choose her successor to like Lizzo or someone, oh. just any random person to become the new benevolent dictator of the fan base. Listen, I think it's going to be Tom Holland, right? He just discovered Survivor. Yeah, that but Michelle yeah, but he's, well. his post Spider-Man stuff is bombing. I don't know if he has the, the liquid cash to do this. Mike, he has uh, Marvel money, right? Even if post Spider-Man isn't doing well, I, I hope he had a good contract. Okay, so... But let's think about this before we move on to something that's it's more relevant, I guess, is what if Tom Holland and his agents decide that in order to get his movies to do better, it is to start funding the Survivor Fan Favorite Awards so we, like we do with Sia, support her his career yeah. so that he can continue doing that. And honestly, I would respect that a lot. So oh, yeah, it's, it's a good PR move. And certainly, you know, I, I am a journalist. We sometimes do get the, I, the chance for companies and studios to sometimes like push a little bit of money in in exchange for like writing positive articles maybe it could be something where it's tom holland almost promoting his latest project i kind of be like all right everyone watch the crowded room carolyn here's one hundred fifty thousand dollars <laughs> like i i don't know if that would if, you know you know what knowing this fan base it 100 percent would that's, <laughs> that's the other thing as well is looking at this through the lens of i know all three of us have watched big brother that is such a study in human behavior when it comes to fandom and rooting for a player, especially when it comes to loving someone when they're the underdog and then hating them when they're the overdog, but then loving them again when they're on the bottom. It is so interesting to see people's abilities to like and dislike someone change over the course of a season, just depending on where they sit in the pecking order. And I do feel like even though Survivor is a much more package program and we're not seeing everything i do think a lot of those attitudes still prevail as well yeah i think that's actually a really great point and i think um you know big brothers fan base and survivors fan base have diverged a little bit more i think at times or like they don't represent the same constituencies i think big brothers fan base seems a little younger to me but like in general their favorites tend to be very similar to the survivor favorites uh, to an extent i remember like when janelle won it's like they start looking a certain way because they appeal certain ways but also i think the underdog aspect is very clear mm -hmm. and the fact that we get such real live understanding of how the fan base is reacting i think is actually the most interesting because i think mm -hmm. the survivor fan favorite award you can be very popular in the pre-merge and then kind of go sour post-merge and still win it yeah. you know just because like your popularity is established early on especially when people are starting to figure out all the names and if you're framed in that way it's easy to remember all those details, especially because the finales are just not counted towards who becomes a fan favorite because voting has completed by that point. Right. That's the thing is that, well, maybe we'll talk about this in an exercise down the line, but back in the day, we used to have the penultimate episode on a Thursday and the finale on a Sunday. So not only did you only have, you know, before the finale. So oftentimes we'll see a winner take it because they don't know if they're going to win or not, but there was only a like, three-day turnaround essentially so it is pretty wild i would love to look at the ballot sheets and see how many votes exactly were cast between them because while people were obviously had more eyes on survivor due to there being fewer options that is still a tight window especially considering that the majority of that is a weekend Mm -hmm. And it's like, did they cap capture the absentee ballots? Have I we searched them for the hanging chads? What yep. is going on here? It's such a misunderstood process because quite often we don't even hear the breakdown of percentage from the other players. Mm -hmm. We'll hear who the top three is or it's a top two, but it was a blowout. Like we'll hear things like that, but we really don't know, you know, what the actual like data is 
at all. And honestly, I think Sia should start telling us who she almost gave money to. <laughs> the same way. Well, she did say that the very first time. She's like, oh, yeah, sorry. I was going to give it to Keith a while ago, but like I sort of forgot. And you know, if you don't set a reminder on your phone, it just kind of leaves your brain. I've got other things to do. Exactly. But you know, Sia gives away different amounts and they have quite a bit of uh, gaps between her highest amount and then, you know, the 15000 that she gives away because there's like rules about the taxation on all of it. Yeah. That is some insight into who the top three versus top one is. Yeah, she well, does. She, she'll, right? she'll note things, but I want to know who did. I want to know who wins the Keith Award each season as well, which is close to being the CF fan favorite, but technically just referenced you um, didn't make the runoff ex unfortunately exactly. and I, i'm so intrigued to see like sit down with her accountant he tells her like okay this is how much overflow you have this season who do you want to give it to and she is like trying to run through the wikipedia list being like do i remember this person what are they known for is it her honestly on a lark did she give a hundred thousand dollars to carolyn and said okay is carson also doing exit press can you put him on the line i'll, I'll throw fifteen thousand more his way this is just incredibly mystifying to me well, if if i do get the chance to interview sia i will say right now this will be one of the things i will ask her i will try <laughs> to get inside that veiled head yes you know i think it's definitely possible that she is sitting down with her accountant now and running the numbers i cannot imagine that there was a, a meeting held prior to her storming the stage when ty won the money that felt a little more perhaps spontaneous yeah, her discretionary spending. <laughs> like, like yep. she's, she, she can authorize certain things very quickly. But uh, I do want to ask everyone here, you know, about the core question we have, which is that, is James Clement the ultimate fan favorite? And just kind of getting the quick yes or no answer from the beginning. Nigel, what do you think? Um, you know, before we dive a little bit deeper uh, with all of the details, I think... I will say, yes, James is the ultimate fan favorite because I think that this era of the show is actually when we really build a bunch of the mega legends of the show that I think continue to be the legends. You know, when we think of our winners at Warcast, you definitely get people from this era. I, I think that to me, James winning back to back in this golden era of the show, in my opinion, I think that cements him as the ultimate fan favorite. Mike, what do you think? I'm going to say no initially because I think some of the criteria that I brought up and some other extenuating circumstances, particularly when it came to his Micronesia win, might uh, inflate the stats a bit. And I think we'll talk a bit about the legacy that James leaves that I think if you're looking at it from a 2023 lens and despite the fact that we don't have a formalized fan favorite award, uh, that there are still characters that are considered fan favorites from that era – I do think, unfortunately, the way James ends things perhaps removes him from that running from a larger perspective outside of the award itself. I think that's a good point. I will also say no. I don't think James is the ultimate fan favorite. And that's because ultimate suggests there's, there's one. I think that one is Rupert Bonham. We can I, expand uh, on that later. Yeah, I, think he I, technically I totally co-sign, yeah. And so, but like, I think James is a great depiction of a fan favorite and it should be remembered as truly a fan favorite. I think sometimes people, you know, the further we get away, people who are new fans may not realize how big of a deal he was, that this is someone who won back to back. You know, the first person of color to like really be ascended this high into the, the Survivor fandom. I think that's a really, really big deal. And so there's a lot to really investigate about James, but I don't think he's technically the ultimate Survivor fan favorite because I think you can find people who watch Survivor a few seasons, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and they'll remember Rupert before they remember James. And I think that does make, you know, maybe James is not the ultimate fan favorite based on those specific metrics. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because James Burns, hot and bright, emphasis on hot, he appears <laughs> in three out of six seasons between 15 and 20. And that's his tenure on the show. That's him and Amanda in a nutshell. And it's so interesting to look back on the fact that obviously we now have 44 seasons in the rear view mirror that this person appears on three of them over essentially a three-year period, and that's it. Yeah, it's a very, very tiny uh, slice of the of the overall server pie. So um, uh, it's it's hard to like think of that person could just be the the true ultimate than someone who can like really kind of jump around. Then like the Boston eras. Robs of the world, who's 
career stretches from the very beginning to very modern. Yeah. I'm and sure. if you think about it, like you can find any, any post about Survivor, like I'll say on Facebook, something with a more general, wider audience that can incorporate more casual fans. There is someone bringing up Boston Rob's name for no reason. <laughs> Somewhere about yep. like, I wish Boston Rob was on this season. I was like, he's been on like 12. What are you talking about? And I think Boston Rob's a great character and all this, but like the fact that you can be brought up so often, unprompted, is like a really sign of someone who's truly a fan favorite beyond just like the the season of the time. And I think those are things I think about when I think about who's the ultimate fan favorite or who's in those conversations. Sure. Uh, so Kev, do you want to give us the quick hits of the James Clement journey for those who may not have seen some of his seasons very recently? Yes. So James starts in Survivor season 15, Survivor China, 30 years old, grave digger from Louisiana. He's known for his physical strength and his great work ethic, which propels his tribe Fei Long to being so dominant uh, strategically and in the challenges. And uh, in his time there, he acquires two hidden immunity idols, which is a very exciting moment in the show. But he is blindsided in seventh place before using either of them. He returns in the season later in Micronesia as one of the favorites on the favorites tribe. This is Micronesia fan favorites. Um, he showmances with the Parvati Shallow, but she will betray him along with several other women in the game to form the Black Widow uh, Brigade. They won't be able to vote him off because he gets medevaced again in seventh place this time. Uh, and then he returns a few seasons later in Heroes vs. Villains. Uh, after winning the fan favorite award twice in China and Micronesia, he is one of the heroes here. But his depiction feels certainly more villainous. Uh, he's very much more grumpy, gets into conflict more often. And uh, he ultimately goes pre-merge the first time he does not make the merge group um, and is booted um, in in like 15th. 14th, 14th place. yeah he finished 14th. seven he finished seventh the other times that's how i remember just add them together and you get 14 exactly so i can't wait till he comes back again and is another divisible by seven number there's only so many options for him but yes. I, i'm excited for it season 50 they're going to cast specifically 21 contestants so james can finish in 21st <laughs> exactly exactly so um yeah that's kind of the the quick rundown on james so, Mike, do you recall what your thoughts were on James as uh, his first season China was airing? 100%. I mean, I was really excited to talk about this topic because while I am somebody who watched Survivor basically from the beginning, I think from my own maturity perspective as well as like discovering my own online footprint, I would say the like post All-Stars to what some would consider the middle era, even though it doesn't feel middle anymore of like, Season 9 through about 2021 was really when I started getting into the fandom in general. And so season 15, I, I do remember very well because I was about to go to college. And what I still take away from it that definitely hit me in the time I was watching it is that James Clement is one of the funniest people to ever play Survivor. I think what caught me by surprise was the surprise of it all. That first, this man is absolutely chiseled beyond a measure looks like nowadays he could be like a resident pit crew member on drag race and he's <laughs> a grave digger he's the guy that we used to see from pet cemetery right he's the groundskeeper willie this is a grave digger the other thing that immediately caught me is the fact that despite him being probably the physically strongest survivor to play maybe besides jonathan young across hundreds upon hundreds of contestants in the show's history he starts by being like, yeah, I don't really talk much. You know, the people I usually work with don't do don't talk back. Uh, and so to, to have this like big guy that is usually used to succeeding in this type of game kind of struggle early on with connecting socially with people. But that goes away fairly quickly. The thing that I was immediately taken by with James were, of course, his one liners, his babbling sound bites, whether it's him giggling over the pure idea of Jamie, his nemesis, playing the blank slate as a hidden immunity idol, whether it's him giggling at the fact that Todd shut up him in the form of Jean Robert in the final tribal council, uh, or him sassing. Him and Jean Robert, I think, were a perfect team because Jean Robert had his head up his ass so far, his <laughs> poking out of his own mouth somehow, and James just completely no-selling him. Like they, I remember they were on a reward to like a Chinese pagoda, and Jean Robert's like, wow, I can't believe they have good wontons here. And James is like, why, yes, I do believe that a thousand-year-old place that's making wontons would have good wontons, as John Robert. Like, to see James kind of grow into his own and be able to get a tongue, a pierced one at that, that's also a really interesting image that we forget about, as James did have the pierced tongue going on. But of course, 
the other big thing I remember is that James is the first of unfortunately many contestants to follow to be voted out with an idol in his pocket. And not only that, two, he's the first contestant to have two idols as well. This is only a few seasons after the concept of two idols in a season were introduced in Fiji. His, he is still hailed to this day as making one of the dumbest moves ever. That was like arguably the biggest part of his thing in Micronesia was him as he tries to vote out Jason saying he's the dumbest survivor ever. Him officially telling Eric that he's the dumbest ever, survivor ever. He gave an award to Eric in the finale about being the dumbest player ever. And still he's brought onto the stage with Ghost Island alongside Eric. So he can't shuffle that title off enough. So those are the two things I remember really from his first season. I would say undisputably i think he is maybe the biggest character from that season uh just in how much he was able to pop he had some underdog stuff going on with the swap that we'll talk about and then obviously building to him not having a head for the game whatsoever perhaps for that more simplistic style that you were talking about kevin leading him to make one of the flashiest exits in the game's history that asks you know one of the biggest what ifs of what if james just played his pocket change idol that he had that night yeah, I, I think it's a really great question. And, you know, to me, it's like, I think part of James's why he's so successful as a fan favorite is that he is someone that doesn't, that like around this time in the, the show, we're seeing a lot more advanced strategy develop. I mean, the mm -hmm. idol has been, I've been around for a little bit. So people are thinking about how do you flush idols out? We have the Stacey Edgardo boot, just, you know, like one season prior. So we're like really kind of getting into the meat of like, what can you really do as a survivor contestant in this time? And like Mike, I feel like my time as survivor fan came around post all-stars right? I was so young pre all-stars that I remember my thoughts, but like, you know, at the end of the day, they were like casual, like with your family watching those types of things for me. And then I found Survivor Sucks around like Fiji time. So that definitely involves my worldview and like sees how I'm interacting with it. And I was actually very anti-James in the beginning. Mm. You know, I, I, I was really excited for when he came out, you know, as a character, because I remember the promos for China was, was really big because we had not been to China. China's like kind of opening up, you know, the Beijing Olympics haven't occurred yet, right? So like, there's like, a lot of like excitement around the China's like cast per me, like, like release and both James and Courtney, because the, their body types are so different on the spectrum of things really get a lot of commentary on like entertainment tonight, all these other types of like, kind of like pop culture shows. So I remember like really being drawn in by him as a character, but you know, I was Survivor China premieres and listen, it's Survivor China. There are two Asian people on the Jean Hu tribe. I'm Asian. I'm rooting for the Jean Hu's. Like I, to me, like the Phalongs, I've always been surprised by how people love the Phalongs, and they are undeniably a very iconic and great tribe. But my heart was always with the Jean Hu's because they're an underdog group that is trying their best. You know, they're like kind of like the Fongs and Gabo. Oh yeah, and, they, like, they are. They are up against maybe the most like stacked tribe, considering that. On Fei Long, you had James, you had Aaron, which we'll incorporate into the swap. You had John Robert, who like granted goes his own cockamamie direction of being a lazy guy, but like still has large mass to him. Mm -hmm. And the women are fairly strong as well. So definitely one of the most uneven initial tribe matchups. And granted, this wasn't by theme. This was designed by the producers. To your point, Kevin, it's not a Fong situation where they handpick themselves. So <laughs> for whatever reason, the producers decided, yeah, Zhang Hu's going to get absolutely slammed during the first portion of the game. And they have a lot of physical challenges at this time too, when they are having to be on the two boats and knock each other off into the water. I, I mean, how were the uh, Fei Long men going to lose? Yeah, I mean, and that's right. Well, well, Dave thought by getting naked was the answer to that. Uh, True. So, like, you you get like so so. I always love the Jean Hu's, and to me, like, as I'm getting very excited about Survivor strategy right that's like coming mm -hmm. around this time james kind of represents the opposite of that you know james is like don't bite the apple we don't need to do all those things and as a jean who fan an underdog fan and a strategic fan i'm like james what are you doing like i was so frustrated i felt like and i felt like james was being so rewarded often for really kind of being the opposite of what i wanted in my fan favorites because well my fan favorites are closer to people that james tends to be frustrated by really mm -hmm. confident socially unaware strategically assertive women or people who identified with especially as a gay survivor fan at that time right and a suckster at that so like you know it was just not matching up and james has a habit of like kind of tying himself to people who tend not to be people i wanted to see succeed because i think survivors it's most fun when people who were supposed to succeed the strong people the, the socially aware people whether they be the codas or the fei longs actually have more obstacles in their way so I really wanted that to happen. And then by Heroes versus Villains, when most people had turned on James by that point because he's, his 
attitude had not come off as nearly as congenial as people expected it to. I was like, well, this is the same James I feel like I've been seeing for years. He gets into fights with people. He's overconfident. He hates it when people strategize beyond uh, their position in the game. And funny enough, at that point, I started becoming a bigger James fan and seeing how like this is the same person, how this person can be really fun and exciting and appreciating him for all those things. Because I think when you're really new to Survivor, especially as like a teen and you're young and you're still learning about the world, you really it's hard to understand you can like both sides of a feud or both or two different rivals at a time because you're rooting for the season as a whole. Whereas I think at the time I was very like tribalistic in my appreciation for these specific underdog figures against people like James. And now I'm like, oh, James is great. I wish there were more characters now today in Modern Survivor that didn't take the game so seriously because it was so fun to have someone who just thought about it in a different lens and gave us just more to chew on. So yeah. I'm much higher on James now, but at the time, you know, I actually was very critical of him. Yeah, it's so interesting to see. Again, I think people just don't like monotony or repetition. And I think nowadays we have a bastion of characters still, but like it's a lot of strategy game focused content because the people they're bringing in are largely fans of the game, want to play the game specifically. And not to say that James wasn't. I mean, he's going to make several remarks about being on the favorites tribe, feeling like a fan on there. And of course, the infamous Superman in a fat suit comment to Colby that he was obviously a big fan of Colby. But James is somebody who, despite the fact that he said he went to Barnes & Noble only, what, like four days before he went out there, ends up being known for, like, being the camp life guy. He's the one that's hollering good morning off key to people to wake them up. He's the one who's chopping the bamboo at the ass crack of dawn to wake people up. Like, he was the workhorse at camp and in challenges. And, Kevin, I think you make such a salient point because I experienced this a bit from time to time, especially in modern day seasons, Australian Survivor, for instance, there was a recent season where an all guys or nearly all guys alliance ends up controlling the majority of the game. And people did wonder out loud, like, okay, why do we champion all women's alliances? And why do we try to strike down the all men's alliances? And what I've always argued is exactly what you argue is like, it is a, it is a fact, a hard stone fact that men in this world are advantaged and privileged to certain things and oftentimes find themselves in more of a voice position, whether it's from a leadership role, uh, an amplification role, a volume role, what have you. And so when you watch a show like Survivor, it's like Earl Cole said in a very different perspective. You know, you don't want it to be, uh, you don't want it to necessarily be a microcosm, a slice of life of civilization. You want it to be a utopia. And so I do think that a lot of people look at reality TV as a way for the more disenfranchised or people who do not necessarily have the loudest voices in the room or get to have the loudest voices, be able to do that, to see the people who can't necessarily thrive in the outside world for numerous reasons get to do so. So I can see on the surface again, why like you look at James and you think, okay, this is another guy's guy who is going to dominate the game. And that's not what I want from this show. But again, that's what draws me to James as well is that like, despite his physique, he is not that guy early on of course one of his most infamous moments is when leslie niece of all people opens up to him and she asks what do you do and he very matter-of-factly just replies bury people and that's it <laughs> and that's james really in a nutshell is that like he can be very curt i think to a biting point as you mentioned but he can also be so deadpan and so funny and again that's not something we necessarily see from our typical alpha male big strong goose i pick things up and put them down type of thing. And I think that's something that I didn't realize I appreciated in the moment, but I definitely do now that I think despite the fact he very much resembles, especially from that era, right? We're still kind of in the tail end of the Machter era that we were getting in seasons nine through 13, 14 in particular, that James has so much personality underneath those very good looks. Yeah. I think you're totally right, Mike. And, and I think that the way that James is able to subvert a lot of expectations, I think contributes to his uh, position as a, a fan favorite on the show. Uh, China was one of the very first seasons that I watched and because I had heard that it was just very well regarded. And so when James is first introduced, uh, I, I see exactly what you're saying, Mike. He's very traditionally handsome, massive, chiseled and you make a lot of assumptions about that person and so when he immediately opens up to leslie's sister christian and needs to get advice on how to play in the game and like navigate socially with people where she's like well just make sure you ask people questions you know it's like i didn't expect for james when you just first see him to be someone who 
is not able to like easily get along with people socially because you imagine that people that look like James are probably very popular, they have a lot of chit chat with other people. It makes sense when you realize he's a grave digger, right? But I think that also hides the fact that he's going to be, as you said, Mike, one of the funniest people to be on Survivor. Because if I'm realizing, oh, you don't spend your time with people, you don't feel nearly as comfortable, I don't think you're going to have that quick wit that he certainly has. And I think it should be also noted here is that, is that quite often the, you know, different parts of just like in comedy can appreciate different things uh, comedically in people. So like, I think, you know, Reddit fans, online fans, super fans, we love someone who's acerbic, it was someone yeah. who's very witty, someone who's very quotable. So like, this is where like Courtney Yates, I think really shines as like the funniest person to a lot of those, th this demographic, right? Um, maybe Katie Gallagher, even from a few seasons before, like kind of remembering these type of moments, maybe these sharp barbs. They're a little bit dry kind of. James is actually a little bit like, kind of like vaudeville. Like he's like actually over the top and a yeah. big personality. He loves to laugh big rather than kind of stare in the camera and tell you what something is. So it's also very easy for people who appreciate one specific form of comedy to not really notice that James actually is hilarious. And yeah. I think it's like recognizing that only just enriches your experience watching James's seasons. He's so goofy. I mean, to your point, compare the way Courtney reacts to losing her nemesis, Jean Robert, obviously very happy, but a bit muted compared to the week prior, James falling <clears throat> over himself at the mere idea of Jamie holding up blank piece of wood from the Home Depot saying, Jeff, is this anything? Like, this man is incredibly expressive, which, again, is so interesting that that version of him comes out, and I don't know if that was something that was just dormant within him or if he really is more like that and maybe he does just have a bit of that initial anxiety of, like, well, I don't really hang out with 15 people, especially all these people from all these different walks of life, but I suppose he really does come alive in part due to what happens to him in one of the worst twists that Survivor has ever seen, right? One of the most unfair things where it's essentially pick two people from the other tribe to vote out at your leisure, where him and Aaron are swapped over. And I think James expressing, oh, the humanity is putting it mildly. And that I think is a large, large contributor as to where James starts going on this fan favorite wagon is that from the beginning of that entire storyline, Kevin, your beloved Jean Hoos are now personified as the villains. They go from being on the bottom of the game to now being on top. They are laughing in the laugher's face himself and James and throwing the pieces away, throwing the challenges, saying there's nothing you can do. And I remember at that time, people just absolutely vilifying the crap out of Jamie and PG. And now James has, I think, suddenly become the most popular castaway of the season. Exactly. And I remember feeling so ups so defensive of Jamie and PG for their th their their challenge throwing. Because I remember, you know, social media is really starting to develop. You have Facebook certainly isn't existing here. And people were so, you know, quickly like, uh, Jamie and PG, they're so evil for throwing the challenge. How dare they try to get a leg up in this game? And uh, it's like unethical. And I'm like, Ethan, who's a fan favorite, threw a challenge to get rid of Silas and y'all were okay with that. Like, I remember feeling so, like really my, my server opinions were starting to really solidify about how, what I kind of expect and not what my value system was. So I remember it very clearly, but I think, you know, in my own like narrow tracking mind at that moment, I didn't realize how much more that made Jane so popular. I mean, he, he's literally staring down a group that is so vicious. You know, they're willing to throw a challenge away. Someone who's actually really good at camp. Someone who seems very nice and friendly, you know, to work with. And they totally don't even care about him. And what I want to say, because James gets really funny at this moment um, as well. I think why James is so popular is that he has a really great understanding of irony. He's, mm. you know, once he gets, he gets swapped, he knows immediately what the audience might think and how he feels about it. And he expresses it to us. And when like, uh, Eric in Micronesia has the whole idols, like the, the necklace situation. He's the first one to blurt it out and like kind of like tell us directly how, what should we be thinking about these types of things? <laughs> the banana etiquette, he's like clearing up immediately. He's like, this is stupid. You know, yeah. like he's so great at yeah, when, when I'm at home, I just eat a banana when I want to eat a banana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like his straightforwardness at times where maybe he shouldn't, but like it's so hilarious that he does. He really, I think, shines in those moments. And so he's really great at like talking to people who think they're super smart and making them look stupid by being so common sense about it all the time. And so whether that's PG or Jean Robert or um, uh, some of the people in his other seasons, he's so great at like kind of getting them to shift perspective and getting the audience to laugh with him in so many times. So I think that's why James is so popular. But um, 
Mike, do you have any other favorite moments from James before we start to uh, move on to looking at some of the online commentary about him? Well, you talk about obviously like the James and Courtney discrepancy in size. It's just a hilarious image in and of himself. And it actually pays off really nicely in Heroes versus Villains, right? When after James like slams down the bag in the first challenge that the heroes win, the immunity challenge, she's like, oh, I think he's on the wrong tribe uh, to see that heel turn that we'll get into. But I think we're forgetting about the James and Todd dynamic, which is the bigger relationship between the two. And the two of them have so many great moments together. Let's remember the reason why James ends up with two idols is because he is screwed on John who and Todd comes up with this plan to kidnap James when they win the reward challenge, tell him where the idols are, find the idol on Fei Long, give it to him. And then he knowing where it is also finds the John who one as well. And then I guess they just, never have the conversation afterwards like hey can i have that back it's so interesting in the new era right how we're doing all of this three card monty with advantages mm-hmm. because of knowledge is power and people are willingly giving things away to others when like here's james only the second season after the idol that we know of nowadays is a thing like saying no nah, i'm gonna sit on this thanks buddy but a couple of moments i really remember is first when todd tells james this plan james just like unconsciously pushing him out of excitement but because it's james and it's todd it's like he goes flying through a wall like a cartoon character like (laughs) it's so good physically and then the other thing i remember is also todd doing a james impression james has such a fantastically Mm. funny way of speaking where he's like he's got that southern drawl to him but he's got a lot of really funny things to say on top of it and nobody does impressions of him except for todd who just out of nowhere and i think this is on mario's funny with 15 just does a James impression out of nowhere. I think it's when he argues with PG after they fail the drum challenge. He just goes, bitch! Like, (laughs) to hear these two of them interact with each other was so interesting, maybe even more so than James and Courtney, because also Todd plays, obviously, a very large role in the fact that James is going to get blindsided with the idol in his pocket that Todd gave him all those days ago. Yeah, the the relationship is really interesting because you could argue that, you know, probably from Todd's perspective, that he was there to extend James a lifeline in this game. And that if he was not helping him out with the idols, that James could have totally gone home. And so, you know, you have like a little bit more leeway to be the person that boots them because you were part of the reason that they were going to be staying around in the first place. I never quite understood why Todd didn't just like clarify when he was handing the idol to James and say, well, if you don't need this one, you give it back to me once we're all back together. But, you know, we don't get every moment of footage while they're out there, right? Um, I do want to give a special shout out to a moment between, uh, well, uh, a moment uh, of James in confessional where he's talking about Denise. And he's saying, you know, if Denise was only a little younger or if I was a little bit older, I think the quote is Denise would be in trouble. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, which is like, borderline predatory but again coming out of james it somehow works and that's also like the odd couple here is again this like absolute demigod of a man from louisiana and here is the mullet lunch lady from boston and they somehow have found even though james has at one point it's survivor it ain't love connection about the idea of frosty and courtney he has maybe found his own love connection i do remember when denise is voted out at the final four like james of all people has the biggest reaction to it I would have really liked to see what would have happened if Denise made that final tribal council. I think there's a non-zero chance that James proposes, to be completely honest. And what would be hilarious is that, you know, James's showman's options goes from Denise to Parvati, two people who are very similar. (laughs) He has a type. He has a type. Exactly. (laughs) So, you know, it's kind of fun to see see those differences, you know. And it makes you wonder, you know, if Denise and James had been on, like, Big Brother. You're not out there starving. You're locked in a house for a longer period of time. Maybe they would have had a showmance. Ugh, and that's the showmance that we all would have been rooting for. I mean, what? what, what Move what? over, Jeff and Jordan. <laughs> yeah. I want Jamise, I guess, would this be their, their portmanteau or or Dames? No, I like Jamise better. I like Jamise. Jamise is really, really good. Uh, Nige, do you want to cover anything else from this section? Um, I, I just think that there are so many moments that James has where he is just so funny and confessional that I want to emphasize again for people that James is one of the funniest 
survivor contestants that we've ever seen. Yeah. And I'm sure uh, throughout our conversation today, we will like pepper them all in, right? Like, cause usually we ask about like, what's everyone's like top favorite moments of a character. But I feel like we've already ran through like 10 of them that I all already really enjoy. Yeah. I think the, um, the one, there's a couple from Micronesia. It's, We'll get into it. Not a lot from Heroes versus Villains, spoiler alert. Micronesia, we'll talk about it. That definitely seems more of an echo. I mean, it makes sense. This guy literally played back to back. They didn't even watch the entirety of China when they went out to play Micronesia. So he sort of just keeps repeating the same golden stuff. But of course, especially in today's hindsight, him eating the bats not once but twice is one of those rare moments of like, Ugh, gross delicacies at JSB, like, oh, this is great. I think it compares it to wet rabbit, which sounds maybe not the most appetizing, but hey, you know, a pot for every lid. But uh, his reactions to, like, the challenges, I feel like, in Micronesia are ones that always stick with me. I quoted it before, but the best version of When It Rains, It Pours, which was during Micronesia, the sequence of Alexis like uh, dropping out shortly after Jeff does yes. the countdown to step down for food. And so Jeff says, oh, sorry, you didn't step down during the window. So no surprise for you. And James goes, oh, that would be, I'd be so sad if that happened. He accidentally moves his arm and says, oh, bitch. And then all <laughs> the water dunks onto him. And then of course the auction where to your point, Kevin, he says what the audience is thinking where Eric decides to make the interesting deal i think would certainly fly in a certain corner of the internet nowadays to pay serene money to lick cake off her fingers and james just deadpans there's something wrong with that boy exactly it's so great so it's actually so i'm gonna dive into uh some of the research i found about james because you know this is a character appreciation podcast essentially a legacy evaluation comes with that so i think it's important to understand how do people feel about james now or in the recent years and so i found on the subreddit uh some threads one of them um, you know, talking about the tragedy of James Clement uh, and like talking about how he's one of the unluckiest people ever, maybe. You know, when you think about it, his uh, arc in three seasons goes from being blindsided with two idols, getting medically evacuated, and then also getting a knee injury later. So like he has like a lot of big moments in the seasons. Um, and so people kind of like start this conversation about like, you know, why was he so popular? Why was he a fan favorite? And funny enough, one of the top comments here reflect a lot of things we've already just said naturally. They say, because he was really freaking funny. I mean, he enjoyed bat soup. He wanted to sleep with Denise and almost killed Todd with a back slap and cried laughing at John Robert's expense during final travel council. And every other thing out of his mouth was comedy gold. He was a terrible survivor player. He was a, a wonderfully funny character in his first two seasons before turning heel in Heroes versus Villains. So, you know, a lot of references there. Other comments about James being hilarious, even intentionally, uh, when he introduced himself in Survivor China, it's the I bury people quote. So, like, mm -hmm. James actually is very prolific. Think about, like, how many moments we can easily kind of rattle off. Um, and then someone else in another thread about how James is so popular because someone suggested, I don't get why he's so popular. So everyone's like talking about what's going on here. And someone acknowledges, which I think is very accurate here. If I recall, he was regularly making funny comments and joking around camp. Portrayed as a, on screen as a tireless worker, he was probably one of the most physically fit people to be on Survivor. He's a big human being with a big, loud voice, so he stands out. Couple the fact that he was an interesting, he has an interesting job back home as a grave digger. And hey, you have a pretty notable character. And so I think these kind of, it's like James's like kind of moments have really kind of lived on years later uh, beyond his time on the show, which speaks to why he's still fairly popular with the fan base. Yeah. Can we talk about the physical aspect for a second? Because first off, it should be noted, James Clement is responsible for a challenge being retired. It's that infamous <laughs> challenge where you're supposed to move the two poles in the water while the lighter people are supposed to step over. And the ideal thing is that, okay, one person steps out onto one pole and then you move the pole in the other place. They step onto the second pole, switch, so on and so forth. Micronesia, James just says, I'm a taking myself, picks up the pole and just walks it across as like Eliza is holding onto it. And Jeff, I think says in his challenge commentary, like the producers did not think of that. That's certain. <laughs> and so they absolutely retired it after that. And, yeah, people do like to point out that James has never won an individual immunity challenge. I mean, what I do think is interesting is, listen, we can certainly opine about the lack of modification that has come in Survivor Challenges, especially modern day where they're hanging out in Fiji. They have 
literally a challenge graveyard of props and set pieces. I have been there a couple times from challenge uh, challenge proper so that like you can repaint them, utilize them, especially when you're filming back to back. But I also look at like Micronesia, for example. So James, I think, participates in four or three individual immunity challenges. Uh, so he does, uh, of course, Last Gas, the iconic now uh, renovated challenge. He comes in third, I believe, which is, again, nothing physical based. It's holding your breath and remaining calm under pressure. Then it's when it rains, it pours. I think he actually ends up going out fourth during the awe bitch of it all. <laughs> and then uh, the last immunity challenge he participates in is like some sort of rope obstacle course. And he nearly beats Eric to win his first individual immunity. Of course, we love to joke that Courtney Yanes has more immunity necklaces. Did you win an immunity, Jean Robert? Did you win an immunity, James? The one that she won was very much based on like balance and weight, both of which James is not necessarily acclimated for. So, you know, yes, the meme is definitely there that James sucks at individual challenges. I think that's a little overblown. I think the challenges he happened to participate in, and I think the challenges that are especially nowadays more individual, are not necessarily strength based maybe if he had done the one where you like you know the gabler get a grip challenge right where it's to a portion of your body weight and it's just testing arm strength i think he could have actually won that one but i do think there is some credit to his physical resume even outside of the carrying things challenges yeah i think that's that's an important point and there are plenty of people on the show who are really influential and important in the uh, pre-merge challenge phase of the game whose skills are not perfectly translated to the individual portion. But I think that also is an important contributor to part of why he is so popular with the fans. Yeah. Uh, I think in the very first challenge, uh, when they're moving the uh, the poles that have the dragon uh, in uh, on them in China, it is James versus Frosty that have to run ahead to like open the gates that allow everybody to continue. And I remember being impressed by Frosty, but only because Frosty is able to keep up with James because the expectation is who could possibly keep up with James. He's so uh, intimidating and mm -hmm. strong. And, you know, I think uh, two very recent examples – Michaela and Jonathan, people who really impressed in the pre-merge tribal challenges phase of the game can really build a lot of goodwill with the fans and yeah. really get you on their side when you're not even, you know, someone who is standing up for your individual challenge performance. Yeah, and I think it should be noted that, you know, of course the challenges change post-merge, right? So of course, like James's skill set does not match, but there are plenty of really strong people in the tribal phase that have never won the individual immunity challenges. Like Sarah Lucina is a great, I think, person to kind of compare to. I mean, she's really notable for her team success in multiple pre-merge challenges and just never comes to be in the post-merge. But um, yeah, it's something a fun fact. And I came across the Courtney Yates and James Clement, who's won more immunity challenges meme in my research too. So it really kind of speaks again that this is something we all know about him, but also like kind of think about the stats that come with that too. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about this uh, Reddit popularity poll I found from 2016. Again, a good Ooh. like touch on right how... when Sia was going to start changing the world of fan favorite as we know it exactly Mike exactly so uh James is uh, ranked three separate times because he has three different uh outings, outings. um so Mike I want to ask you Ooh. there's three outings of, of James China Micronesia and Heroes versus Villains which do you think is the most popular James oh it's by far China Okay, I, you... I, I have to imagine, despite finishing in the same place in Micronesia, we'll certainly get into this. I think Micronesia, he takes a large step back in terms of airtime and becomes much more of a supporting character than a lead character. Yes, and you would be correct. James's highest ranking is his China outing. He ranks 43rd of the 575 characters that they rank in that time. That's pretty damn good. That's top 10 percentile. Seventh percentile overall, wow. third for the season. So of course the subreddit represents a different slice of the fan base than the general fans. So he only ranks behind two contestants in Survivor China. Nige, do you have an idea of who Reddit put it above James? I feel like Reddit is going to choose uh, Courtney and Todd. That is correct. Yes. All right. Like That's you, like... all you had me at Survivor Reddit. Now my answer just would have been Courtney and Todd to basically any question you had. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so some other data here, they talk about correlations with the China outing. Who were people who tended to 
like him, James, a lot more than others. Who did James tend to correlate with other fan favorites or other like voting? So some of the facts here, his most favorable demographic, straight people. Uh, straight people on average ranked him 8.2 out of 10. His least favorable demographic, gay and bi voters who voted him at 6.9. So both are actually still positive ratings, right? Above average. But you definitely see that certain types of viewers on the subreddit tended to like him more. And I'm not surprised. Again, Courtney was right there. You know, <laughs> right? Like they she... tend to be ranking her more. And, you know, yeah. I think... I was on Sucks, right? Which is a big gay by, you know, slice of the fan base as well. And, you know, James just think was like, it wasn't exactly hated or anything, but like tended a lot to like the PGs and the Courtney's of the world more so in China. So, yeah. And then it doesn't help that to the point you made in your 60 minutes introduction, like the people that James tends to get mouthy towards are those types of people, whether it be pg in china whether it be parvati in micronesia and eliza whether it be stephanie in heroes versus villains and i i think it makes sense as to why perhaps the uh the lgbtq plus sector was not that into james considering that like in the reunions that he's a part of both the the first two are all about like james people love how hot you are like didn't <laughs> didn't he made like people magazine at one point they he was a uh, sexiest man of the week According to yes. People Magazine. And then, like, and I believe both China and Micronesia, he tells stories about, like, grieving people, particularly women, approaching him and, like, wanting to flirt with him at a funeral. So it does feel like he probably pertains to a certain subsection and maybe people that are not necessarily desiring that flavor of cereal or more likely to look elsewhere down the aisle. Yeah, the flavor of bat soup, perhaps, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, I think that totally makes sense. He has strong positive correlations with uh rupert china fan favorite uh sorry mm -hmm. rupert uh pearl islands who was a fan favorite as well lex in africa and jervis in uh borneo so interesting kind of like map out i think these are all like um you know men who are pretty charismatic narrators right so mm -hmm. we're seeing again these these tracks we see a lot of things from their uh perspective yes yeah i, I, I think it's interesting though because i think that james kind of chimerically combines aspects of that rupert i think he's going to work with rupert obviously in heroes versus villains but i think he has the hard-working camp ethics thing in common with him that allows him to be such a big presence early on i think lex i think james would hate lex if he played alongside him considering you know lex's uh, idea of gameplay but i also do think that both of them have a bit of that moralizing to them as to like what is right and what is wrong that's what caused lex to get so twisted up about the mm -hmm. vote against him during the clarence vote and then Jervis is never nervous, and he's often cutting, you know, cutting a soundbite or two over the course of Survivor Borneo, no matter what position he was in. And I feel like James has that in common as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, China James, seventh percentile overall. I mean, one of the most popular. Seven again. Yeah, exactly. He can't yes. help it. <laughs> Pick him for lottery numbers, you know? <laughs> so lucky. So then we have James Clement, his second outing, Micronesia. Mm -hmm. Um here he ranks in what percentile, Nige? So we know that China's seventh. You could just take a stab. Uh, I don't know. I feel like there's going to be like a really big uh, yeah. drop here. I'm going to say top 35%. Okay. Mike, does that sound right to you? Do you think it's a little higher or there's lower? There's so many damn Survivor contestants. I think he's going to go a little lower. I think in the moment, to what you were alluding to before, Kevin, I think... The reason why James wins this award is because he was just on last season. I think he even put a couple seasons in between James' appearances, and he does not win this. But I think that that is not going to reflect well over time. And now that we are, at that time, nearly a decade from James's first season, I think he takes a much more precipitous fall. I think he's in, like, the 50s. Okay. Micronesia James... 21st percentile wow, wow. so hey, i think never it's mind. Really? i think it's the bat soup i think james actually and maybe he's more confident about his humor by that second season because he still holds up very well and he does the win the fan favorite award i'm surprised you know that i would have also guessed that maybe he'd be closer to like the 40th percentile he was still very popular but um uh some other takeaways that i found here you know he was third in china he's only seventh in micronesia wow. so i think ah, again <laughs> exactly it's it's crazy um so that you know, is, I, yeah that's surprising though because i feel like in retrospect like i'm i feel like maybe nowadays people would consider penner a more popular character in micronesia than james so the fact that like he still has a respectable finish despite, again, I think taking a big step in airtime and spotlight back from China to Micronesia is very interesting to me. It just shows how name recognition can help with that. Yes. 
most most favorable demographic for Micronesia James again straight you know it's like again the carryover effect the least demographic for is gay and bi voters uh, but um, the fun fact I want to share here is uh, we have strong negative correlations. So the person with the strongest negative correlation to James or so someone that you tend to very opposite opinions. If you like James, you probably don't like this person or vice versa is Xi'an Wong, China, sorry, um, a Thailand Xi'an and also Xi'an have strong ne negative correlations with Micronesia James and China James. This so makes sense. This is a guy that was proselytizing about don't bite the apple. We could all be frolicking naked in heaven. Of course he would butt horns with the she devil. It makes all the sense in the world if you read One hundred percent. Exactly, right, right, right. And you know, it's 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 just again like I love Shein, right? Like Shein is like a contestant that I really identified with. I love the plucky outsider of it all. And it's really in direct contrast to James. I think what I would do to see them on a show together now. Oh, if they were <laughs> up against each other on one season, the confessional gold from both of them would be incredible. Because she thinks she's going to think she's smarter than James, and James will tell her that she's not to her face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? yes. That's the thing is, James, <laughs> when he doesn't like you, he will let you know. He called those Jean Hu's dummies so many times over the course of China. Even when they were trying to come to him like, no, you're in danger. You're at the bottom of this alliance. Come join us like, you stupid asses. I'm not doing that. So James is certainly not one to mince runs. And I agree going up against a woman who will use Hemingway esque in a confessional and like puff herself up about it is a match made in heaven. Yeah. And you know, I think that Sheehan is savvy enough to recognize that she is not always supposed to let loose with uh, her true feelings, but with James being so willing to share them, Sheehan's not going to hold back. Right. So I'm ready for them to come back for survivor legend season 50. Yes. And so now I found the heroes versus villains, James entry here. Fun fact. Also for this negative correlation includes she and Thailand. It still continues. <laughs> um, but uh, where do we think heroes versus villains, James ranked Mike? Where... See, this is tough because like, so obviously James is not good in Heroes versus Villains. And it's interesting because it goes to show something that Mario Lanza has always said. And I, I was listening to a bit of what you guys were talking about with David last week about Jenna. And it's, it's very true what you guys were saying as well, where with a lot of people, it comes down to, I am fine with this behavior when you're in the bottom and you're fighting against something. When you're in the top and you're acting this way, no, 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 now you're a villain. And the way James talks to Stephanie is not too different than like him dressing down Parvati after she votes out Ozzy to the point where he ends up voting for her in the Jason vote. But I think, first off, it is directed towards Stephanie goddamn LaGrosa, someone else who might qualify for the ultimate fan favorite superlative. Uh, and the fact that he was using this kind of bullshit cockamamie logic of like, well, her tribe's lost all these challenges, and so maybe she's the bad luck. Maybe we need to vote out the bad juju. You know, it's a really sucky bias that James is consistently championing this one voice, keep the tribe strong mentality, and that always fell onto usually, like, a woman, right? Whether it's Eliza getting sick in Micronesia after Yao Man being voted out, and James telling her to your face, like, yeah, I think you should go. You're sick right now. Get out of here. Oh, and obviously what he does to Stephanie right now, which Tom... I think rightfully calls bullying the next day. Like it's a terrible look. I mean, Jeff Probst is going to outright tell James at the reunion. You look like you were miserable out there from day one. I don't know if it's that he was in a different headspace, if he didn't like this group or something else was going on at home, or maybe his head got too big and he thought that his shit didn't stink. He was a fan favorite two times over as surprised as he was to win in a Micronesia, but it's a really, really bad look that I think, leaves a bad taste in fans' mouths. I'm really glad that he charts as high as he does, especially for China, after the fact, and sorry that I could see many people, especially after returning seasons, be like, oh, does this taint the legacy of James? It does it to me. Now, all that being said, there are a lot of unsavory people in Survivor history. Uh, even in 2016, when we had over 10 seasons to go between now and then. So I don't know how much towards the bottom he'll be. I'll just go for a nice savory number that james is probably dreaming of when he was hanging out with denise and i'll say the 69th percentile for gotcha. hvv james i'm surprised you to go 77th i thought we were going to get another seven number mike well, for all we know he might be 
He is ranked in the 83rd percentile. Wow. So that's a bottom 20%, but still like pretty good, right? And I think, you know, James's popularity still continues after that. If if he had the exact same outing, but as a first time player, you could imagine that it would be potentially even lower ranked than that. Yes. His most favorable demographic, again, straight people, uh, 5.3 uh, average. So again, it's closer, you know, he's not like coming like the sixes, sevens, eights, like he used to, It's but it's still like middling. And least favorable demographic, again, gained by voters, average of 3.9. So uh, fairly negative. And I'm sure, again, like where they kind of fall into the fan base and who their favorites were, were affected uh, by James's yeah, portrayal there. He, he votes out Stephanie, which again was like, despite the fact that she may use the term gay in a very different way in her second season, <laughs> I think was very heralded in that sort of archetype. I don't know, maybe also the lovers of like Munchausen's by proxy must have loved him being injured in that entire storyline. That was also like an unsatisfying thing. I adore Tom Westman as a survivor character and him being so feisty in Heroes versus Villains was so fun, and it sucked to see him get voted out over yeah. a hobbling James. Uh, and then, then the vote him off right out. It's it's it still it still makes me mad. <laughs> like, Evan, he had to run a race first to prove that he was okay. It's like it's so haphazard. I'm so annoyed by it because I love Tom Westman, and in our Tom episode, you know, that Nigel and I did, you know, I talk about how Tom is not the demographic I tend to always be rooting for. You know, this is another alpha male character, but I find something really special about Tom, and I love his Heroes versus Villains outing where. I I thought he was so good that I was okay with Sari Fields being voted out pre-merge because I thought there was something really exciting about that. And I think it was fun to see Tom have a rival kind of in James who is really antagonistic towards him because they have different ideas about how to play the game despite both being fan favorites for what many people would argue for similar reasons. But like, I, I think there's something interesting about that. I just want to mention uh, Heroes versus Villains, James's highest correlations, Ozzy, Micronesia, Aussie, no. South Pacific. Uh-huh. And yeah. Rupert All-Stars, which I think the comparison here is a uh, cocky fan favorite who returns. These are all people who <laughs> yeah. kind of are able to carry over some Absolutely. of that original charm and maybe be a little bit more mixed in tone Not delivering in the exact same way as they did in the But we're willing to forgive seven. them. I mean, Rupert drowns Jerry, essentially. And, like, we're like, give him and that America was million like, dollars. Yes. million dollars. Do you think that James took the wrong lesson from Micronesia <laughs> with Ozzy? Remember, like, that was his closest ally in Micronesia by the end. You think he's like, I just got to be like Ozzy in my third season. And he took all the wrong lessons from it. I think it's very possible uh, that that's what happened because Micronesia Ozzy is the least popular Ozzy when we did the Ozzy episode mm, with yeah. Beth. And I think he ranks like pretty low because there are people being so angry, uh, frustrated with him. But I love Micronesia Ozzy because yeah. I like I like a good villain and I love I love a, a rebrand and a, the short hair and the more villainous idea is really nice. And so that's why I'm actually fairly positive, despite being very frustrated with James at times, is I kind of love how James is character is so big and so different because i feel like micronesia james feels very similar to china james but this one feels like it's a it's a different james even if it's a bit of a flop in people's minds mm -hmm. but Nigel, i wanted to ask you james ranks 19th out of 20 in heroes versus villains i was gonna guess 17th just to have a seven Ooh. in there uh, so only one heroes versus villains castmate ranks below him oh. on this popularity oh. poll. Ooh, that's really interesting just one um you know i i this is a stacked cast. There are so many people that are absolute legends of the show. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, and, 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 you know, Russell, one of the more controversial figures in the entire show, right? But you can be extremely controversial and manage to be ranked at like 18th out of 20, right? So you can be controversial have, and win two fan favorite awards in a row. Exactly. So I have to think that this is someone that might be one of the most, quote, forgettable from this cast. And I think when I think of my watch of Heroes versus Villains, I tend to kind of forget Randy Bailey because he's out so early. I don't think he's um, at the same level of legend as some of like the other, especially villains that are uh, on the show. And he's more disconnected from how everything is going to play out after his departure. So I'm going to say he's ranked above Randy. Uh, that's a great guess. That's what my guess would have been as well. He is ranked only above Sugar Kuiper. 
I was thinking uh, Sugar I was, was going to be the other sugar. one. I thought maybe the iconicness of the triple blur might have, especially from a Reddit perspective, like mm -hmm. pushed her above. But I do think that the Randy and Sugar vote outs are by far like the two most boring in that absolutely iconic season. So maybe just like the quiet way she bows out at the end of that two hour premiere being one of the most like hot mess first boots in the show's history did not reflect well on people. I agree with you. Maybe, I don't know, maybe also people uh, now, I think, sort of resonate with Randy burning the buff before Redemption Island ever mm. became a thing. Yeah, I think that's True. a good point. And, you know, the Heroes vs. Villains cast is, like, pretty iconic. People are really high on them. So I, you know, the fact that there's only two people in that bottom 17% out of an entire cast. I mean, think about how many casts would have so many people <laughs> hovering <laughs> in that bottom range. It's a testament to Heroes vs. Villains um, uh, as a season. As a season. Yeah. So that's kind of like all the information I have on his current understanding of, of, of James, how the fan base sees him. Any final thoughts or reactions to anything I shared? Um, you know, I, I do actually want to touch on um, the fact that James has played with Amanda Kimmel three times. Yeah, They've been on the same starting tribe three times and we have not brought amanda up and i think it's very interesting that here she there comes she's running with her little <laughs> doe arms <laughs> one of my favorite moments from amanda is actually her running with the doe arms because it's just like so weird and awkward um but you know maybe the reason that james was so miserable out there is that he showed up and he was like I'm living with Amanda again. I don't even like her as a roommate. You know, she's like in a group house. He's like, well, she's the person I'm not renewing my roommate contract with. Well, right? yeah, you know, he, considering the history. Cause so the first one, they start on a tribe together. You know, she is part of the Alliance that ends up saving him. She's part of the plan to give him the idol, but it seems like from the edited perspective, she's the one that puts together the plan to bite the apple and blindside him with two idols directly contribute to the downfall of his game. He doesn't vote for her to win second season. They play together, they separate for a bit. He's more into Parv, she's more into Ozzy, but they still have this like double data alliance plus Sari going on until they betray it. But he does vote for Amanda. I remember his James, though he's so good in confessional and sound bites, was has been like surprisingly lame in final tribal councils. Like, I'm pretty sure the Micronesia one is him just saying, Yeah, I'm voting for Amanda. So Parvati, say whatever you want to. So maybe it's just a matter of then coming onto the beach, they are in an alliance. I think the, the voting block is like the two of them and Rupert for the majority of their time on the Heroes Tribe. But maybe at that point, he's like, I've got too much mixed history with you. Obviously, Jerry and Colby are the bigger to do. But I think mm -hmm. if we're looking at like the spectrum of people who have played three seasons together, I think you have Jerry and Colby, you have Sarah and Tony. And I think like Amanda and James is maybe in the middle of the positive and negatives associated. Yeah, it's a good point. And so actually in one of the Reddit uh, comments that I had found researching James, there was this, I got to find it now, is um, someone says, I love James, a sense of humor, blah, 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 all these great things. And then the final part of their comment, they wrote, wrote I'd love to see J big James get a fourth try, comma, hopefully without Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because it's like, it's so unnecessary to the idea that is being described, meaning it was very important to that person to clarify, it really can't be with Amanda again. It would yeah. not be fair. But how incredible would it be for them to be on four seasons together? You have to have them on the same starting track. And right? like, the, you know, their relationship is not particularly that explored, you know? Like, I yeah. mean, Heroes vs. Villains is probably the most James and Amanda truly that we, we really get. And, you know, it takes three seasons to get there. But, um, uh, yeah. Well, we had to do that. You thought you knew Amanda Kimmel, though. I don't know what question we'd be answering uh, along the way. Uh, no, I mean, I, mean I think I think the question needs to be like, is she underrated or overrated? Because looking at her history, right, she held the record for a long time for number of days played average position. She loses in back to back final tribal councils. Then it's followed up by Russell. And it's interesting to look at like Russell heralded certainly for a while as one of the greatest players. Was Amanda held in the same regard? Why wasn't she? What did she do right? What did she do wrong? Namely, a final tribal. Like, Amanda is someone, especially going back and watching, like, that back-to-back -back season for uh, historians is a really interesting person to cover. Not necessarily from a personality perspective. She might be, like, one of the most regular people to ever play Survivor, let alone participate in reality television. But to see, like, the success that she did, the unthinkable and went to the final tribal council in back-to-back -back seasons. 
it's got to say something. Like, consistency is so hard to pull off in Survivor when you play different seasons with different people. And she was able to do it her first two times. And just like James, it's the same types of place. You know, it's like, again, because, you know, she does second, third, or third, yeah. second. But, like, she's always there losing final tribal you know so like they, they, i love that consistency as well yeah, and I, I believe i believe actually in that opening tribal council in heroes versus villains james makes a crack at it where she answers a question he goes like that's the best answer you've ever given a tribal council <laughs> it's so i funny. think the answer to is amanda kimball the most overrated or most underrated player in survivor is just yes <laughs> you know <laughs> exactly great point uh, I'm going to move on to the historical legacy of James. So, like, how do people feel about him then? I thought, actually, the first thing I'd like to explore with James is his edgic, actually. You mm. know, so editing, how do people rate him and perceive him for that time? Oh, I love this. Um, I never get to talk edgic on podcasts. This is fantastic. I, it's, it gets a little in the weeds, so we won't go too far in because I don't want to confuse too many people. But um, in China, James uh, has 10 episodes uh, that he has ratings for. Uh, his, uh, he gets four of the 10 are positively rated. The rest are, are neutral. I don't think he, I think he maybe gets one negative one on the chart that I'm reviewing that I found. Um, but his overall rating is OTTP, otherwise known as over the top positive. Mike, surprising. Does this ring a bell to you? Oh yeah. 100%. I mean, that's one reason why he wins this fan favorite is like people largely regard him as a popular person though. I think when you look under the hood a bit to that point about the mixed ratings, which usually indicate in an episode, there are both positive and negative moments that makes sense as well. Like when he is again, loudly being the alarm clock for a uh, high day Fung, uh, <laughs> or him getting into fights with PG who is now fallen back to the underdog position. I think those moments of conflict are then sort of like mixed into still James being funny and James being relatively well-liked by the majority. Uh, and he also does become a bit of an underdog as well. I forgot until I was reviewing my China stuff that James pretty much gets targeted like right after Jamie is voted out. That everyone starts finding out that he has two idols. Jean Robert, who was previously his BFF, is furious, actually rallies the Jean Who's to vote with James uh, for James alongside him. So he nearly goes home in a five to three to one vote. If things had changed just a little bit differently, James goes home in ninth place there. So I think it does make sense that that four episode stretch where I'm assuming is going to be the two swap episodes. Maybe the premiere has a little bit as well with the, to your point about Leslie coming to her and being like, I will be more sociable and charming. And then maybe like an episode after the merge, but by and large, when you look at it, more uh, from a micro perspective there are smaller moments of negativity there yeah great point glancing at the chart mike i think that is a pretty accurate assessment of where his positively toned episodes fall yes so um uh in micronesia his final edgic rating is actually mor toneless so middle of the road toneless which is kind of like that visible narrator ass yeah. type of role which makes sense you know james is kind of quite often commenting on others so um uh, my thought is on his edit in Micronesia is that he's more subdued, kind of like Rupert in All-Stars, who kind of went from this really larger-than-life character shifting into someone that's kind of popping up every now and then to talk about camp life or other important characters, really kind of give us an understanding of who the heroes and the villains are. Mm -hmm. But themselves, I mean, there really isn't like a lot of like big toning moments. Is is How does that, what is that, uh, what are your thoughts, Mike? Well, yeah, because if you look at it from a strategic perspective, he is brought in immediately into the majority because first he makes a connection with Parvati and then second, he already has this connection in Amanda. And so they work through a couple kinks, right? Johnny Fairplay goes instead of Parvati. They get Suri on their side to vote out Yao Man. But outside of that, James is like largely large and in charge when it comes to a strategic perspective for the majority of his game. So he's not really personified in either positive or negative. Also, he was part of that post-swap stretch where he never went to tribal council but they kept losing people like Jonathan, like Kathy Sleckman. As much as we talk about James being indelicate, by the way, with like emotionally uh, approaching people, I did find he was like surprisingly the shoulder for Kathy Sleckman to cry on during her moment of need, which was very interesting. Like he was the first person she hugged after she decided to leave the game. But I think, yeah, even like the positive moments he has are very fleeting. He certainly does have negative moments. Again, I mentioned just the not mincing words when it comes to Eliza, but Eliza was sort of a pariah on that favorites tribe anyway. So that does make sense to me that he popped enough to get a middle of the road rating, but like 
I can't really say he was positively or negatively edited in one direction over the course of Micronesia. It just was kind of there. Yeah, and like we just liked him so much that I think some people like maybe ascribe positivity, though I don't think that was the editor's intention. You know, like hmm. in the full story of it all, um, I think he's definitely more of a toneless figure. And, you know, I think we also have to remember how many people casually watch Survivor and are not so you know, in the weeds, following things outside of the show. And so I'm sure for many people, when James gets a toneless episode, well, I like James. I remember James. So that's positive, yeah. right? So Mike, I want to ask you, what do you think James's overall Heroes versus Villains edgic rating? Was? Oh, well, it's definitely negative. I think even when he's injured, he is not getting, especially what we get nowadays, right? Of like, you're fighting through it, James. Fantastic. The discussion around James is more so initially like the old yeller thing of like, oh, he broke his leg during Schmergen Brawl. Do we put him down since he can't run the Kentucky Derby anymore? And then it ends on a negative note where, yes, he does point out the ludicrosity of the idea of banana etiquette and the fact that like, yes, he is eating more because he is a bigger person. Otherwise, he will starve to death. We saw that actually with Jonathan on 42 where he actually tried to shrink back what he was eating and he paid as a result, physically speaking. So I think that even those aspects of like, look what James was able to push through still gave him a negative ending. It can't be anything but negative in the episodes where he wasn't negative. He had a couple of wisecracks, but by far when he is the center of the spotlight, it is of him yelling at someone complaining <laughs> about something and without any sort of positive tinges to it. Yes. Yeah, so his final editing rating in heroes versus villains based on this chart that I have you know, found is over the top negative OTTN. Um, and in this person's rating, they started him off uh, middle of the road positive for the first episode. I mean, James is actually pretty, you know, positive. Well, like you're supposed to remember liking him in the premiere. And then he gets some over the top negative edits. And then he ends with over the top mixed, you know, because by the end we're, we're laughing with him with the banana etiquette stuff. Like there are mm. things that were supposed to be a little bit warmer to him on, even though we, I think are supposed to be on the side of the top of Tom in the grand scheme of things, which is sets up for the heroes to be the dumb tribe that we're not rooting for at the merge. Right. So he think he's used as a character to help us like understand how we're supposed to feel about these groups. But I did want to talk about in his second episode against Stephanie, he has a rating of, over the top negative, negative. So that's wow. the, the double negative, which is very, very rare. Um, uh, it's only happened a handful of times overall in Survivor Edgic history. The ones mm. I've noted here is um, Natalie in Micronesia when she does when she had her breakout episode about. Oh, hating... wait. I mean, yeah. When you say you're going to floss your teeth with someone's jugular, that does seem O T T N N to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the double negative is there, and then also Debbie in Game Changers when she had her whole like meltdown about Brad and Haley. Mm -hmm. So these are like really you know, big negative moments for characters. I, mean, I think it is for that Debbie got a double negative in that episode of Game Changers because whenever I'm watching modern survivor if they pan by the certain rock formation i always turn to kevin and say that's where debbie debbie got mad yeah. <laughs> every yeah, single yeah. time without yeah, there's fail a, uh, there's the i'm pissed rocks yeah i feel the same way <laughs> it's, it's a notable survivor landmark so yes um you know my overall analysis on james's edict between three seasons is that you know in the charts that i'm consulting here he never once gets a complex personality rating which is a considered the one you give to like someone like boston rob someone who is yeah. giving you so many different levels and ideas james quite often is either commenting on others or he's mm -hmm. a larger than life personality that we're supposed to feel something about um and he's always being commented on which is another quality of someone who is usually gets an over-the-top edit because they're kind of character like they're more of a caricature in a way and so people he's always are talking about him his appearance the way his mannerisms are his look you know his threat level we're always talking about james in some way um and then the other thing i wanted to acknowledge is his confessional account which i was able to find mm. did you know that out of all three-time players in survivor history james only ranks above one three-timer in overall cumulative really? confessionals wow i wouldn't have expected that i mean his confessionals are memorable but like yeah. he doesn't have a whole lot technically in the grand scheme of things i think especially in micronesia like i feel like mm. when people play three times they almost always have two seasons where they pop or like one and a half james pops in china doesn't really in micronesia and he only is there for what like half the season in heroes versus villains so that does make sense who is he above now? I'm trying to like rack my brain across survivor history of three time players. 
that he would have more confessionals then. Uh, I'm having an aneurysm right now. I can't think of it. Candace Cody is not someone who makes the end game goes yeah, out. Any season. And the correct out. answer is Candace Cody. Wow, oh, good job, wow. Nigel. I just... Yeah. I mean, Kind of a James nemesis also, by the way. <laughs> like yes. they, they also share time together. Yeah, she was the one. She and JT were the two that I think were really stumping for James to go even over Colby. Uh, whereas Rupert and Amanda were like defending James to the very end of, no, he'll heal. It's still good. We could get rid of Colby now. Yeah, they love James. So um, James has 57 confessionals between three seasons. 31 in China, the bulk, of course, as Mike alluded to. Makes sense. 18 in Micronesia, 8 in Heroes vs. Villains. And we also should remember that, you know, Survivor used to do a lot more confessionals towards the beginning. You know, Jeff yeah. Varner ranks above James in overall confessionals. I think a lot of that has to do with mm. the more survival commentary he used to give people in the early seasons. Like Kelly Wigglesworth still has one of the highest records of confessionals yeah. in the season because back then there were shorter smaller confessionals yeah if you watch borneo like it cuts to them doing yoga by the beach and they're just narrating the entire time it was much more documentary like yeah yeah, yeah candace absolutely. only gets 34 to james's 57 she gets Ooh. 15 in cook islands i'm sure half of them are from exile island uh, <laughs> <laughs> she gets 12 in heroes versus villains um and then she gets seven in blood versus water i'm sure a lot of that has to do with being booted fairly early and often being a you're on the redemption. So like, we're seeing you in the challenges. We're not seeing you really interact yeah, with others. She, what are you confessing about? Right. She has a max of, I think, like five minutes of screen time in her time on Blood versus Water every episode. Um, and he's only, like I said, James is 57, episode, 57 confessionals in his season. Um, as a reference of how small that is, is that in Survivor 44, Jam Jam, Carolyn, and Carson all have more than him in that single season than James gets in between three. Wow. Yeah, I truly mean, iconic trio. Well, that's the thing, though. For James, it shows that a little bit goes a long way. That yeah. despite the fact that he has accumulated fewer than this entire trio in one season, as iconic as they are, the fact that he did make such an impression, especially in that first season. And granted, they edit things a little bit differently now. I do think, from a modern day perspective, like if someone is giving gold, like Carolyn and Jam Jam, especially they'll keep going back to them, especially considering the two of them were going to tribal so often in the pre-merge. I think th it does make sense as to why they would outrank him given the different editing styles and use in confessionals, even from season one to 15 to now 44. Yeah, great point. Uh, the next thing I'd like to show is the 30 seasons... The official CBS Collector's Edition of Survivor. I, say, I grab mine, mine's over I there know, well. right? <laughs> so I found this and I was like, well, it was actually really hard to find historical information on how James was felt at the time. I recall a lot of it as someone who was there, but most websites that were writing articles about Survivor in 2007 are not around today, you know? So it's hard mm -hmm. to find a lot of how people felt about things. But I thought this is still a great way to see how like Survivor like kind of like sees James, how they think about James at a time. So uh, some, some fun facts I found from my review of um, this magazine that they had released is that they did the hot 10, hottest 10 men. James left off. He is wow. not there. What? I think it was a popularity poll put on my fans. Maybe they forgot. Like John Cody's on it and he's like season 27. So I'm sure there's some kind of like- Yeah, because that, was, so that, came, out, that, that, that came out in 2015. So yeah, it would have only been a couple of years removed from John Cody. So it's like stuff like that. And like someone like Ozzy who kind of like stands the test of time is there. But I do think James does feel like a snub. Um, he's referenced in all three of his seasons because they have a write-up on each season. But you know, again, it's very small, quick sentence that Jeff writes up. In China, they mention how- uh, a memorable moment of the season is when James is voted out with not one, but two hidden immunity idols. In Micronesia, they mentioned a dangerous finger infection forced James to be pulled from the game. And because he was on the jury, he came to tribal council with an IV drip. And in Heroes versus Villains, they mentioned that Jerry Manthe's new approach to the game transformed her from villain to hero, while James Clement got grumpy and morphed from hero to villain. So again, kind of these quick James-like vignettes if you will james so, needed to become a villain so that jerry was able to ascend to hero so we can honestly, describe that as a selfless it. act <laughs> worth it james had his two seasons you know jerry finally needed her time in the sun yes and my final thing for the historic uh kind of review here is i did find uh from tvfanatic.com someone's review of the episode um uh where james gets voted off of, right. In China. Mm. 
of the tribe in Heroes versus Villains. Oh, in Heroes versus Villains. In Heroes versus Villains. Um, and what's funny is that this is an iconic episode. You know, it's the banana etiquette episode. But a lot of the content revolves around the Tyson boot because, of course, that was a really big moment. And James Shear's double boot episodes, not just in Heroes versus Villains, but also Micronesia. So, and, and, and that's the other thing as well. People might not remember that despite James's situation being the title of the episode, banana etiquette, people think, okay, it ends with the hot mess that was the Tyson boot. But no, they had to go to tribal council first because the villains won the hot dogs. And so they had to deal with all that first. And then we get the mercy killing of James to follow as kind of like a womp womp to end that iconic episode. Yeah, and that's why James ranks us 14th while Tyson is one spot earlier just because he got voted off, you know, uh, uh, earlier to, you know, so everyone else can have that food. But in the write-up, they mention, oh yeah, the heroes were involved in this episode too. <laughs> Were it not for the forced dual tribal council, I don't think I'd address this pathetic tribe at all. Again, a great w window to how people were viewing the heroes at the time. After a lackluster effort at the last challenge, um, the heroes go and screw it up again by eliminating James over Colby. How can they go back and eliminate James after keeping him last week? What is the rationale here? Once you make the decision to keep James and his injured knee, just go with it. Even beyond that, Colby does absolutely nothing to try and stay in the game. He even goes back and admits defeat after the challenge and says he just wants to enjoy his last afternoon in the game. This has not been James's finest season between his verbal assaults Ooh. and his knee injury. But as JT said, quote, You'd have to see him on the stretcher to know how injured he was, end quote. He certainly wants to be in the game, and spirit matters a lot more in Survivor than people give it credit for. James managed to beat Colby and Rupert in the immunity challenge, but now they vote him off because he's a liability, question mark, after he proves that he's more valuable than not just uh, uh, Colby, but Rupert too. I wanted to pull my hair out. So this kind of speaks to Mike and I's reaction earlier about the Tom Westman of it all, that I find it very strange that you would make the exception to keep him over Tom, considered one of the best challenge performers in Survivor history, but then use that against James in order to keep Colby, also someone who was a best challenge competitor in Survivor history, but like had not been really wanting to be there. Mm -hmm. I found very baffling at the time. And I'm glad I found this one review that represented a viewpoint I recall people having back in 2010. Yeah, we're very, it's still a little bit of a question mark. Maybe it is that sort of, okay, I made a mistake, so better to cut mm -hmm. off the gangrenous limb. I mean, I, let's talk about James also retiring challenges, unintentionally so. I mean, he ended up leading to Schmergenball officially being two and done, right? That they did it in Samoa, led to poor Mikey Borto, uh, not Mikey Borto, and Mike Barassi uh, having hypertension, and as well as Ben Browning do, doing some like very dirty tactics. And they're like, well, we're in Samoa. Let's just do it again. Surely nothing can go wrong. And then Russell ends up like breaking James's leg, basically. Yeah. And you know, these are also the ends of, the, of a lot of the physical challenges in Survivor. We really mm -hmm. see a step back yeah. in a lot of the physical confrontation, the wrestling challenges. How hilarious, again, that James kind of, you know, 50, China is, has a lot of those challenges in the pre-merge. So he really holds this very specific window in Survivor Challenge history as well. And I'm sure we remember it in those ways because of his body. And who would have thought... James competing in Schmergen Brawl of it all. He's the one who's injured, where you would expect he's the one to do the injury to someone else. Right. It just happened to be himself. So uh, that's what I have for the historical legacy. So we can kind of shift over into kind of evaluating James's legacy as a whole and um, move on with this thing. Sure. So, you know, uh, Mike, actually, uh, you shared a great idea, I think, yes. uh, of playing a little bit of a game here and working through who we think would have been the fan favorite for the seasons that they had discontinued it for. And I think that this will actually be a bit helpful as we try to truly assess if James is the ultimate fan favorite by spending some time with some of these other potential fan favorites as well. Sure. Yeah, I, I think this is something that has been talked about in the scuttlebutt across the internet for years at this point. We were actually... The 10 year anniversary of the last time the fan favorite award was officially given away on the reunion show has passed. That was Kara Moen back in 2013. And so we have gone a decade, basically, sans the Sia stuff of Sprint or whatever company it was giving away money to the popular vote of the season. And I think being able to like take the temperature at the time, let's also establish here, especially the names I am about to say do not reflect upon my own views of said people in the season, both as a person and as a player. 
But given the reaction behind them at the time, I think it was actually a really interesting exercise to take the pulse as to who would probably earn it at the time. The other thing to throw in here, though, is interestingly enough, they discontinued this during Kara Moen when social media, especially the Twitter side of things, I think was really taking off. And considering what it has become, I would have been really interested to see, like, how does this end up translating into the Twitter space? Are players actually jockeying for votes? I know David spoke last week about, like, Rob Cetternino sending out a bunch of email blasts to vote for him for America's Tribal Council. Are people hopping onto Twitter spaces and trying to campaign for it? It would have been really interesting to see over the past decade, like, how social media would actively get involved in that vote. And we actually just saw uh, in the season of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars that just ended, (laughs) part of their twist had the losing contestants competing for uh, a fan favorite vote, essentially, and they were given free reign to post whatever they want on social media as a way to influence the outcome. I think it's also interesting to be able to look to the big brother vote at the end Mm -hmm. of the season and thinking about how social media was trying to push the vote in one direction or another and, you know, how representative is Twitter's view of who the favorite should be versus what the general fan base's view is also something that's kind of interesting to to think about as well. And it's hard, you know, it's so much harder now, I think, to get the pulse because the broadcast, you know, the gatekeepers, you know, and how it was perceived forever, it was so much easier. It's kind of kind of put on a plate to us. Who is the fan favorite that they want us to root for quite often is the person who was the fan favorite. I mean, these are all the people who won quite often are like chief protagonists of some sort in the Mm. season. But now, you know, we all like are interacting in kind of echo chambers to an extent. Like even if I use Twitter as a pulse, the algorithm is giving me the the people I want to like look at. So like, even then it's a little harder, but I think we can still probably get a pretty good understanding of how people thought would be the the fan favorites at the time so yeah is it blood versus water we start with mike yeah so that is the first one i'll offer up my pick at first because i think this is a pretty easy slam dunk here i think despite playing with a bunch of returning players i think sierra easton is the biggest fan favorite from that season between her being like the highlighted new player, the loved one that makes it the furthest uh, between making some of the biggest moves, including forcing the first rock draw in 23 seasons. And of course a memetic moment that transcends space and time of her voting out her mom. It's clear how much Jeff loved her considering she was brought back two times thereafter. I think it's very easy. She's the fan favorite here. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. And Sierra has also benefited from the fact that she, uh, is really pushed by production, I think, because the moment is exactly what they were probably hoping for when Mm -hmm. they made a blood versus water season to be able to explore the relationship between a daughter and a mother. And if you really dig into it more, there's also the questions of like, well, she was going to go anyways. How momentous is this moment? But the show made it a really big moment. So I think it's hard to argue against Sierra being- I think Sierra gets it. Unless Rupert just, you know, from the 20th (laughs) place, still is able to rally the support. So I think people are just like, wait a minute, Rupert was on this season. I forgot. I got to get to the polls right now. I think Sierra is. And I do think that it's interesting because I remember RJP had done the fan favorite kind of with their own, with with, uh, their listeners. And I think Hayden Moss won it, who I don't think would have won in the general fan base. But again, it tells you again about how the different sections of the internet value specific things. So- 28, Mike, who do you got? This is another very, very easy one. He is regarded very differently nowadays, hence my disclaimer. But Spencer Bledsoe is one of the most beloved underdogs in Survivor history in Kagayan. Add on to the fact that he made it all the way to finale night, which definitely helps. Again, think about the timing. The very last fan favorite contest that happens in Karamo and Brenda Lowe who has done nothing until that final episode in Karamo and gets in second place purely because people had just watched what happened to her. So you need to remember, what have you done for me lately? Spencer built up this entire arc going into the finale. I think he absolutely wins this bar none. I 100% agree with you. I think that's what happens. No objections here. Uh, San Juan del Sur. So this is interesting because this is maybe we see a bit of divergence. I think if I am assuming that perhaps the you know twitter bubble is not necessarily representing the overall bubble we saw this a bit with the second chances vote as an example i actually do think 
Keith Nail, may he rest in peace, would get the money that Sia once thought he would get. I think there's an outside chance it could go to Natalie Anderson because she had been building a lot of momentum, especially going into that finale. She had just gotten rid of John Mish, her enemy in the game. But Keith was so beloved and almost a James Clement, like very different reason that he was so just so stand out, stand stood out against everyone else around him, as well as having this a lot of comedy, a lot of that Southern hokum to him from a character perspective. And so I do think that would win out with the larger audience overall than maybe the more concentrated sec- section of audience that was salivating over Natalie. I do think it probably would be Keith as well. And I think that Keith is helped by the fact that he is a part of a very strong two opposing alliance season. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there's anybody in his alliance that is really even in contention for the fan favorite here. Whereas I think that Natalie's group, you know, that you have Natalie, I think you have Jeremy who could certainly pull in votes. I don't think that Jane, um, uh, John is like, an unreasonable choice for some people, but I think that Keith cleans up on his side. Yeah. And I guess Natalie and James, sorry, Natalie and uh, Jeremy, I think split votes to an extent. And Keith isn't splitting votes with any of his allies, really. I mean, like, you know, anyone who really wanted Alec to win is probably just voting for Keith at the top, right? Like that, that strategy is occurring to an extent. You could have stopped at anyone who wanted Alec to win. I, do <laughs> think, I don't think his own brother would have voted him for winning. That's, that is hilarious. And, you know, who is the most James-like out of this cast? I think it's Keith, right? Yeah. And Keith is also from Louisiana, takes the game a little bit differently, and I think appeals to a lot of fans. Fans. And I remember being really impressed at how Natalie was so popular by the end of Sam Wendell Sir because she was not coming into the season because a lot of people did not like her from The Amazing Race. But I don't think she could beat Keith's kind of like popularity overall. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. So Dirty 30. This is where I think we get into the Boston yeah. Rob, Kim, Bob camp of, oh, mm. wait, it doesn't mean that a non winner can't win this re- award. I think Shireen has a very good chance. There's a reason why she got onto the Second Chances cast because yeah. of the story she had and especially what was done to her in you know the events leading up to her boot. But especially going into the finale, Jeff Probst maybe told us how the season would end before the season when he said it would produce one of like the most likable winners mm-hmm. ever. I think it's got to go to Mike Holloway here. I think had he not won, he would have definitely made the Second Chances cast it's very rare that an underdog does end up winning the game even though we saw it in back-to-back seasons and the entire story of that end game right is that he was the lone hero in this sea of villains and despite the darkness around him he was the light able to prevail and pierce it and end up winning so i think they would add what is a hundred thousand dollars to his million dollar check and give it to mike holloway yeah i i completely agree with you i do think shireen is someone who does have an outside shot at it. I, I think that the no collar Alliance uh, definitely inspired a lot of at least like online fans. But mm-hmm. I also think that Mike Holloway probably appeals to a lot of uh, everyday America as well. And, you know, we, we do see him stand up for Shireen and when he's like standing up for her, it probably makes it easier for her fans to also vote mm. for him as the person to win. Yeah. I think it's Mike or Shireen. Definitely. Um, all right, 31, right? That's next? Yeah, 31. So this is interesting. I'm really divided, and I would love to see where you guys would go. Because, like, my first impulse was Kelly Wentworth. Uh, she was someone who, again, has this underdog story, comes in as definitely someone with the least amount of credibility, the most amount to prove in her second chance. She does so with aplomb and is coming in as, like, one of the big characters to beat is holding Immunity Idol going into the finale. But if I look at the larger audience and especially who they were into, I actually think this would go to Joe Anglum. I think we forget how much people adored Joe Anglum. This could also be to what we spoke about with James, a bit of a lingering effect from the popularity he accrued in Worlds Apart as well. Hell, there's that moment where it is Shane Powers sitting with Spencer and Joe in the audience saying, okay, one of you won't make it. And Shane's like, or I, I don't even know if it's Shane. Maybe it was Brad, Brad Culpepper. Culpepper. Was Brad yeah, Culpepper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great memory, he's like, though. He's like, are you kidding me? Like, it's going to be these two. I think also the fact Joe makes it to, I think the, you know, we, the Abby episode aired and then the poll would have opened. I think Joe got booted the week before. So it's not like 
he's spending that much time out of our mind's eye. So I think as much as I would want Kelly to win it for the awesome journey she had during the season, if I'm looking at the fan base at that time, I got to think that Joey Amazing is getting it. Yeah, I think you're probably right. You know, I think a lot often in these returning seasons where we have a fan favorite, it is someone who was really popular in their previous season as well, or carried over. You have James Rupert, Ozzy, you know, these are all like people and even Malcolm winning in, in uh, Karen Moen, you know, he almost probably won the Philippines one as well, only losing to Lisa. So I actually do think Joe is probably a really strong bet on here. I think Kelly is really up there though. And I think she's only become bigger. And I think, you know, had social media campaigns also been part of this, maybe, you know, she can edge it out. Oh, she does another rap. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I also think Jeremy and Spencer probably still get a lot of votes just because of their enduring popularities. But I think you, you make a really good case for Joe. Yeah, I think, you know, had Kelly just been a bigger character her first season, she probably does have a better chance. But, you know... Kevin and I have told the story before of uh, we were backpacking in Ecuador and we're at a hostel and we mentioned to somebody that we love Survivor and they were like, oh, we also love Survivor. We're like, oh, who's your favorite player? And they said, Joe. You know, we then say, oh, uh, you know, we also love Sandra. And they were like, oh, who's Sandra? We don't <laughs> know who that is, but they know who Joe is. So How? I do think that Joe probably cleans up. Transcends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, 30, 32. Um, yeah. So this one, I, I feel like this one's a bit easier. I mean, there's a reason why Sia gave him money. I think Aubrey, especially going to that finale, would have a shot. But I think it's Ty. Ty is still to this day one of the most unique contestants. If I were to come back and do another one of these, if I was given the opportunity, I might ask to do an episode on Ty Train because I think, almost like James, he is a player that we have really forgot. He also played hot and bright. He appeared in two seasons practically back-to-back. But, like, what he was able to do and just, like, how incredible of a character he was in Survivor Co. Wrong, I feel like it's tragically forgotten in Survivor history just based on everything that has happened before and after it. But in the moment, he was the guy to talk about from this season. And so I do think that Sia here reflects the the voters nicely. I think you're absolutely right. I think as much as the super fans were all talking about Michelle versus Aubrey, you know, who should have won. If you look at the casuals, they were all like, why did Ty get no votes? Like that was yeah. their biggest issue. And I think that tells you a lot that Ty was just that popular and he was groundbreaking. I think you had a queer Asian person becoming the fan favorite. So, you know, it's, it was, I, I remember being very touched I mean, by talking it. about his experience being a refugee, you yeah. know, I mean, Ty is who we are talking about after the premiere of Ko Rong. And I don't think we stopped talking about Ty the entire season, but yeah. I think what the internet remembers is the Aubrey versus Michelle war that seems to rear its head on, you know, occasions. Yeah. So. And, you know, Ty's connected to the biggest plot points of the story. He's one who churns on Scott and Jason, people who were really hated. That only gives him more credibility. I think Ty definitely wins this. Uh, Mike, who do you have for 33? So for 33, I have David Wright. I think yeah. David is a prototypical example of someone who would win this, someone who's very witty in confessionals, also very self-deprecating and like a very different type of comedy to your point that you made earlier, Kevin, than James, who is very much more about like directing his comedy outwards. David was all about directing his comedy inwards and self-flagellating with the remarks he was making. He has this beautiful metamorphic storyline of the guy that was covering his ears when his trimates were hammering to becoming the odds on favorite to win and getting voted out. Obviously they wouldn't have seen the finale to know that like he'll become the fallen angel and get crushed. But I do think that he had built up enough to garner it. The person I had in second place might be Jay. I think people were really liking Jay and he just had that scene before voting would open with Adam where, you know, Mm -hmm. they talk about like their shared history with their mothers. And so that could be something to put him over. And the fact that he was in the hole, he was without an idol going into that finale, but I feel like David was just such a popular player that it couldn't not be him. I 100% agree. Yeah, same here. Uh, Game Changers. This is one that I feel like has a a lot of trickiness to it because we have so many huge legends coming in, but you also have a lot of our huge legends going much earlier than we would have preferred. So what are your thoughts, Mike? So this one is going to be a little out of the box because I look at the cast initially and especially who made the end game. And I think, okay, Suri, 
She won the game, but she won it before. One of the first ones back in Exile Island. She makes it to yet another finale, her third. It makes sense that she would be, you know, the one to pick here. But Serene Game Changers is like pretty dang subdued. And yeah. I would not necessarily think she'd get by on name recognition alone. This will probably go to the lowest placer on this list that I have amounted to. But look, sadly, the big headline maker, one of the biggest headlines in Survivor history was of what happened to Zeke. And even though Zeke was voted out at this point like a month ago, I have to imagine, and especially at the time, the groundswell support from basically the entire community, nay, the world around him, it is wild considering, you know, the the way that I think the trans people have just been weaponized and used nowadays, considering that those people would probably be so much more open to Zeke six years ago on uh, Survivor Game Changers, but that's besides the point. I do think his story would transcend the amount of time since he was voted out. And I do think he would get money here. I, I think that's a great point. You know, I remember the day after that episode aired, it was on the front page of like CNN's website. You know, yeah. so many people outside of Survivor were aware of what happened. And, you know, how could you not feel sympathetic for Zeke and, you know, want to give him a little bit of extra cash through a vote if you have the option to? Yes, yeah, see ya. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> listen she could have been there and she doesn't give money usually on the returning seasons because it's like i think she sees them as like they don't need it as much i guess but i think zeke is a great choice it's someone who i come to mind too i think technically in Suri as well i think theoretically uh ty could also have that kind of rollover effect from his original True. time that's so common and i do think a lot of the super fans were getting into tie fatigue a little bit by the end of 34 a but tie. i i think exactly but i think there are like a lot of actual different options i think this is one of the most evenly distributed like it's not like the one big character that's going to get like 80 percent of the vote i think you'll find a lot of people with lots of different like, plural like a plurality number here but zeke's a great great choice for that um now we have 35 yes h h h it's ben Let's just say it right now. Yeah, it's Ben. Yeah. Uh, I think people at the time obviously did not know what was coming with the final four. So in the moment, almost like Mike Holloway style, Ben is personified as this me against the world guy who somehow keeps pulling idols out of his hat. I mean, I will still say that like going into that finale, watching Ben's popularity absolutely crater has been one of the most interesting things I've seen as a modern Survivor fan. And do like not necessarily no fault to his own, but like due to obviously the mechanics that were working in his favor. But I do remember coming out of that penultimate episode, people were doing like the ticky tack of, well, was he allowed to give Jeff the idol to play before any mm -hmm. votes are cast? But even outside of that, it was pretty much like, okay, it's Ben against everyone left. And I do feel like of everyone left in the end game, I think Lauren had some popularity, but Ben had the story. He had the airtime. He had the underdog aspect. That's a perfect formula for a winning the fan favorite on top of winning the money type of mm -hmm. thing. Absolutely. And the and the depth that he's talking about topics, I think there's a lot of people in the fan base want to see, right? You know, he's talking about, you know, PTSD and all these things. And that really resonates because I think people also forget how large so many like more military and blue collar people watch the show and really, really identify with those things because that's why they're being drawn to it. Um, so as, as though Ben is not the most popular person, his win certainly is not the most popular with so many online critics. I think he does win the fan favorite award by a big margin here. Yeah, would totally agree. Uh, we have Ghost Island. So this is one where my mind is divided again. So we know Sia gives the money to Donathan. And this is something you mentioned before about how a player can often like amass popularity in the pre-merge, of course, as much as, you know, uh, not as unpopular in Heroes versus Villains as James Randy Bailey did the infamous like Vimeo cut of Donathan diving down to get the balls in the second episode. He certainly got a lot of positivity and fan fervor towards him. But then the edit starts shifting in the post-merge towards the Dom Wendell of it all. So like, I personally am going back and forth as to whether it would be Donathan as like the heart. And even towards the end of his game, he was becoming the underdog again. He was starting to bristle against the Dom and Wendell of it all to Laurel's chagrin. But I do think there's a chance it might go to Dominic as well, that this might be the like Russell, Boston, Rob, Kim category of, okay, the edit is 
so shifted in this mm-hmm. person's favor. We can't really give it to anybody else because we don't know them. And Dominic and Wendell, you know, I had to check the confessional charts. I do believe Dom was getting more content than Wendell. So I think if you give it to someone in that pair, it would probably be him. Mm -hmm. I think I know who the person is. And I feel pretty confident about this. But Najee, you want to go first? Oh. (laughs) Uh, See if you can peg the person I'm going to. So I I do think it would be Donovan because... I think uh, you're right, Mike, that between uh, Dom and Wendell, I do think it would probably go to Dom. I I think that there was a little more of a focus on him as a character in addition to the player in a way that we did not exactly get for Wendell along the way. But I think that they could also split votes between each other because people also did really like Wendell too. And I think that Donathan is... uh, because he's not associated with them as a duo in the same way, that I think that my my gut tells me that it would be Donathan. So early on, my first instinct was was Donathan, who I think I would have voted for probably myself. Uh, he's very popular in the pre-merge. But I think technically the person who would be the most popular person from this season would be Michael Yerger. Oh, that's a really good oh, call. That's a really good yes. call. High visibility, super memorable, distinct identity, right? He's so young, but he doesn't look like he's 18. He handles himself pretty well. He's like very mature. And I think he's like, yeah. in, in, in my personal analysis of, of Michael Yerger, I think he's kind of boring, actually. Like, he's a little monotone, but he's an underdog. He's against some of the biggest competitors. Who is he splitting votes with, per se? I can't really name them. I think Michael Yerger might pull it off. And it's kind of crazy that I... Because I forgot about him when I was thinking about, you know, who would it be? Like, he's like the fifth person I think of. But when I hear his name, I'm like, I think he could really run yeah, away with he, it. No, he was really heralded at the time. This was like the quintessential example. Sorry, Julia Sokolowski. Of like, oh, my God, teenagers can play Survivor. He was the quintessential underdog, even though, like, Donovan takes that title a bit. Like, even during the swap, he was working against mm-hmm. all these Navidis that were voting against him. And look, we talked about uh, James's demo. He is very easy on the eye, something that he has made a career out of postseason. So I think that's a fantastic choice. I think he would get it. And he was only voted out, like, I think a few weeks before the voting would open. Too, exactly, so. yeah. And I think he's just memorable. I mean, I feel like I see Michael Yerger's picture everywhere. Like, no matter what, like, it's, it's, it's like there's pictures of people talking about him, like, even still. Um, so I feel like, yeah, he's, 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 like, he's like very present for someone who I forget about. When I, when I think about all the strategic stuff that happened that season. Uh, 37. So this is interesting because Sia gave the money to Davey, and you could, again, follow the money. I'm not going to because you talk about timing. What happens in the penultimate episode of Survivor David versus Goliath? Christian Hubicki is voted out, and I think despite a lot of the positivity around Davey even going into that episode, right? Like he does the entire uh, like uh, decision matrix with uh, getting paint all over himself. Christian was just such a big character, has the underdog story to him, very distinct, like we've talked about with several fan favorite characters. I think he would win this handily as the fans would basically say like, well, Christian lost out on this money, so we're going to give him some here. I agree. Yeah, no no uh, disagreement at all. I think that Davey actually probably benefits a little bit from kind of like taking the mantle of the underdog after Christian is voted out as well. So I think... Uh, you know, we all wanted the supercut of him in the challenge with Alec, right? Oh, yeah, with Jeff yeah. Probst and all of yeah. that. So, like, you know, it makes sense that that's who we'd want. Uh, Edge of Extinction. I mean, listen, I believe Lisa Welchel is so far the only non-returnee to win the fan favorite in an award that had returnees in it. This guy will join her alongside Mount Rushmore. How can it not be Rick Devins? Exactly. This was, like, the guy of the season. Edge of Extinction has an absolute wackadoo story, but the one consistency, especially in that post-merge, was the rise of Rick Devins from being voted out to returning to consistently being left out of votes to finding and playing idols to winning immunities. Like, this guy has everything you would need in that prototypical underdog story that is worthy of that money. And the fact is, Sia gave him the fan-favorite money, the equivalent to it, even, at the reunion anyway. I... Completely agree. I think it is absolutely Rick Devins. I also believe that Reem Daly probably has the biggest discrepancy between how early you are voted out and how many votes you end up getting. Yeah. And all of them are from me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like constantly hitting the the, the creating fake accounts. As often as you can. For Reem. 
you know, just that she gets the shout out at the reunion about like, being in the top three, the way like Denise Martin was in the top three in China. Like, I just want to hear her name. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that, like, hey, we loved her. Yeah. So um, I think that's great. What I'm most interested in from you, Mike, is 39, because I think, you know, there is a lot of factors that go into this one. Yeah, so the two I'm really between are Janet and Elaine. This is another headline-making season uh, for some very, very bad reasons. But the thing that people took out of that absolutely clusterfuck two hours of Emerge episode from Survivor Island of the Idols was how much people were loving Janet, the woman that was out there voting out her closest ally for a good cause, who was on the bottom, who found an idol, who was going into the finale with an idol. The only person I think that could possibly contend with her would be the woman that was voted out in that penultimate episode, which was Elaine, who was a very beloved character. Again, has that those aspects that we were looking for, the fan favorite of like the simple Southern person who has very funny sound bites and is absolutely hysterical and just got voted out. I could see a contingent that's like, well, she just lost. Let's make sure she gets the money. I don't think it's coincidental that the two of them alongside Jamal get the CM money. So I really go back and forth as to, okay, the general popularity of Janet, especially in the post-merge, weighed against the relevant aspect of Elaine just being voted out. I think those are both really, really good choices. And the third person I'd like to suggest here is Kelly Kim. Mm. Um, you know, I, she's such a big focal character. And I remember watching the Kelly Kim boot episode at like a live watch party. Oh and, my God, I am so sorry. Yeah, talk about that. And you know what's so interesting is, you know, my master's is in sociology. So I watched Survivor very much in a social experiment. And I'm very excited when we talk about big ideas and big topics that kind of translate to our real world. So I love that type of stuff. And so while all this is happening, Kelly's booted, like I'm kind of like in awe about how like this really reflects so many things about our own society, about how people don't always speak up when they're supposed to. Mm. So I remember like, this is like, a powerful episode. And then I turn around and go, oh, everyone else is pissed. You know, like, and I get yeah. it. And so that's why I think Kelly has a chance here. I do think the way that people came really hard down on Missy and Elizabeth and all these other things, they had a lot of mi- really uncomfortable feelings about it all. I think that could hurt Kelly's overall stand, like voting, like, prospects here but she was such a big character dan i think is officially disqualified at the end of the the elaine literally the last couple minutes of that episode is the quick little placard of like due to an incident off camera dan has been disqualified so that's like the last thing we see before voting open so maybe that also carries over the social media conversations haven't stopped about that but maybe janet really does it, because she has, she's the the torch bearer after Kelly in a way. Maybe she ends up getting it. Elaine has been like a popular fan favorite for almost the entire season. She talks about filling her cup up in the beginning. Mm-hmm. That resonates with so many Survivor fans in particular. And I think of the late ones we've been naming. A lot of them talking about like Survivor as a journey that they want to like conquer and like learn about themselves in ways like in, in the way that David Wright is. I think any of those three are definitely in the conversation for me. I will say what is kind of interesting here is that we are discussing three different women that we believe would likely be the fan favorite out of this season. Uh, reading backwards, I have Rick Devins, uh, Christian, Michael Yerger, Ben, Zeke, David, Ty, Joe, Mike, Keith, Spencer, and Sierra Easton. Wow, yeah, that's a really good point. And this is when we're also getting to the string as well, right, of the male winners carrying on for a good portion of time. So I wonder if that's not coincidental. So yeah, and so the fact that we it, these strong female characters are really starting to pop up. And actually, funny enough, this recalls me to the Nicaragua Fan Favorite Award, which was won by Jane Bright, who had been received by men also since, I think, Suri, maybe? 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, Yeah, 18. yeah. I'm, look, I'm looking at the list right now. Yeah, so it's Suri, it's Jane, and it's Kim and Lisa. And those are the four women who have won the Fan Favorite Award. So, you know, in wow. some of the, like, we'll even say, like, darker seasons at time where people can be very petty and all these things, I think sometimes these these female contestants, when we had this drought, you know, can kind of solidify that. Um, I, and I do think it's it's one of those three. I could not tell you who yeah. are, it, any confidence, but... Um, I'm glad a woman would win. <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> nice to know. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, any final thoughts on 39 or do you want to move on to Winners at War, which I feel like there's so many legacies to do. Yeah, here, well, Winners at War, I have some bad news for you when it comes to that legacy of women winning the award because I feel like it will stop the combo breaker is happening. 
this is tough because it is such a different season with Edge of mm-hmm. Extinction being involved. You don't have someone like Rick who is arguably like the main character and running away with it. I think Michelle has an outside chance considering that she has done what she wanted to do coming into the season, which is improve upon her legacy and is surprise, surprise, an underdog going in. But I would be remiss to not say that this wouldn't be Tony. I think especially given that Sophie episode where it was Tony's finest hour as a survivor player. And the fact that due to being him being a character as well, he got so much airtime. He took the lion share and the hyena share of it. I do think he suffi- uh, he satisfies that criteria for me of like someone who gets enough airtime to pop and deserve people's attention. I think he gets that and then some. And I think that he also gets it at exactly the right time to win a fan favorite award that is voted on right before the finale. Because in a season of all winners, you can't really have a breakout star because we are so familiar with some of these people. Buster Rob is on his fifth season, right? We know exactly who this person is. But Tony really breaks out as a character of this season, I think, at exactly the right time. I think it's a great point. Um... I think Tony probably is my favorite from that season, so I probably would have voted for him. I think other there's so many other characters, though, that, you know, because they come with their own fan bases coming in. So this is yeah. really, really hard. I wouldn't be surprised if Boston Rob could win. He's on the cover. He's on the DVD cover for Heroes vs. Villains, just by being a pre-merger. This is someone whose popularity continues. We see him and his wife on yeah. the edge. Oh, you that's know, a really like, good point, true. actually. And then we got the entire Mariano family out there as well. So people felt like, oh my God, yeah, how we saw him grow up. I need to send him money right now. Exactly. Or, and him and Amber split votes is the question. Well, and, and Nigel would have voted for Amber, but Amber I'm I sure would have would have taken to social media and said, vote for Rob. And you know what? Doing? I would not have been able to pull the lever for him. I would say, I'm sorry, Amber, I'm still voting. Yeah, and I, you know, I actually do think Natalie Anderson is an underrated person in this because you know i think about my dad i think about the casual fan perspective i think a lot of them loved natalie because she's like a tough chick you know which i think is something that really a lot of fans really appreciate she really the edge is really her story through and through Hmm. um she's an underdog in a way again a quality we really love in the fan favorite but i wouldn't be surprised if tony still was able to pull it out um because you know i actually think the most powerful romber moment is after the edge second challenge where they're all sent out in the finale. Yeah. yeah, So it would have opened the voting would have opened just before that. So that might make them just miss out. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, yeah, different, different ways here. Um, uh, anything about the new era, Mike? Yeah. So let's get into these. Cause these are interesting. Sia is becoming much more plentiful. The Scrooge McDuck Mm -hmm. of the new era. So 41 is interesting. Cause I think a lot of people take away as like, okay, this is the season of Shan. But considering the response to the final outcome, I'm slighted to feel like it might go to Xander. Like, I was surprised with how much of the larger fan base adored Xander. Maybe it's that Michael Yerger effect of, like, he is this attractive, younger guy who is undergoing his own emotional journey. I think a very uh, sizable chance of getting money as well would probably be someone like Ricard who is going Mm. into the finale, was able to take the mantle from Shan, has been sort of the person to beat, has been winning challenges, and also has this story that, granted, will get brought up again in the finale. Those are the two I'm going between. I think Shan was too, as much good TV as she was making, I think was too polarizing even by her blind side, by the larger fan base, for her to to get the recognition she deserves. Yeah, I I think that's a great point about Shan and... I I think you are probably right that it is Xander because I think the edit we were given did tell us why Xander would not win if he made it to the finale. But I think that for one reason or another, a lot of people did not read the edit in the way that maybe the editors intended it to come across because there were so many people who were shocked that Xander was non-viable in that tribal. Yeah. I think Xander wins. I think let's talk about it. What 41 represented, which was this shift in the casting of the show. You have all these people Mm -hmm. of color. You have the all black Alliance kind of coming together and fans of big brother recall the cookout as well, which happened very recently in this timeline. There's a lot of vocal detractors and people who are frustrated with these changes. And, Mm. you know, again, talking about the American electric, these are, this is not a small portion of the fan base. This is like actually a, a good amount of people. And so while I don't, I, I think in many ways, in the way that like Suri and James and all these other like really big people of color stood out in the contrast to their casts 
um, and, and, and latching into some popularity. I think Xander almost does the same in this more diverse cast experience, right? Oh, interesting. And yeah, there aren't he, a lot of him in that cast. There are yeah. not, where usually there's like, like two types of Xanders. You, you double up on, on those people <laughs> because of how casting used to be done, right? There's always like two men in sales or two surfer bros. Like that was common. So now he's the only one. He's an underdog for so much of the game. He has the big moment with the knowledge is power stuff, which I'm sure also kind of carries over. He's with the Yasas who he, are the underdog to the uh, at the merge phase, which people mm -hmm. are really- So I do about. think he does take it because, you know, Ricard, I think again, really, really big character. Um, but like, I think of the contingent that takes down Shan's Alliance, I think I think technically Xander was the most popular. And I was also like you, Mike, surprised at how many people were so big on him. I was much more an Erica person when it comes to the counter alliance. Mm -hmm. But I think I think he was very popular. And the, uh, that 18 year old that carries himself pretty well, you know, I'm sure that really um, still affected a lot of a lot of people because young people also would have been voting for you know the young people who like Joe Anglem as well probably see yeah. connections even though I think Xander is so different than them. It doesn't change the fact that people can group them in, in the same way that like Malcolm is being thrown into the same group as Joe Anglum and they're so different, right? Yeah. So I think well, Xander might pull it off. And to that point, let's move on to 42. And this might be surprising, but I really like what I really like what you said about that that sort of demographic because I have been doing Survivor Exit Press for now going on six years. Over that time Far and away, the most popular exit interview I have done from like a pure clicks perspective was Jonathan Young from Survivor Absolutely. 42. Mm -hmm. He is someone that satisfies a lot of these categories. Again, there's a reason why I linked him up with James earlier. I think James obviously has more of the personality and the comedic chops, but Jonathan was someone who was an absolute hero in challenges, one of the most dominant challenge performers we have ever seen, was a provider was someone who worked hard. And yes, he had his crappy moments, but I think that was largely obfuscated by the fact that somehow this dude was able to make it into the finale and was one fire-making challenge away from making it into the final three. People were just so obsessed with him and the fact that he brought in this environment that honestly we haven't seen all for a long time in Survivor of someone who just absolutely crushes the survival and challenge aspects of the game. So despite the cast being full of so many fantastic people and despite Omer just being voted out and being like the odds on favor to win at that point, the Jonathan dynamic is just going to overwhelm it all. Like the tidal wave that took his trimates away. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I think again, he's so positive in those pre-merge episodes yeah. that it carries over. I mean, people kind of, you know, tune out of the show. They come back in, they remember who's going to like, who's there. And Jonathan is referenced, I think in 43 in the premiere, they talk yes, about yeah. like who looks like the Jonathan, like he has a really strong memory. And again, with this, the new diverse casting, Jonathan, no one looks like him on his cast. You know, it's actually a cast that's kind of deprived of the classic young beefcake role, which he gets to kind of get that lane in and all that, that comes with that. I would have voted for several people over Jonathan myself, but I, I think it's hard to consider him not being the one who wins fan favorite. And I know that a lot of, uh, especially the online fans, soured on him much more after his clashes with Lindsay in the end game. Right. But I think that people really forget how positive people were on him in the pre-merge and not just more casual fans, but I think the entire fan base was really on board with Jonathan. Not uh, only that, but uh, he was also, uh, deservedly, I think, took a hit due to the way that he approached everything going on with Drea and Marianne, then looking at the jury mm. and deciding that they were going to use their idols. But again, to Kevin's point, I do not necessarily think the larger Survivor fan base either cared about it or maybe in this case said like, yes, they are weaponizing race. Thank you, Jonathan, for calling them out on it. So yeah, I, I think he wins this bar none. He may be like the first in a while with these awards that feels like maybe since Ben that will like probably get the biggest share of, uh, you know, the percentage, mm -hmm. maybe besides Rick. Yeah. And you know, it's, this is why sometimes it's good to have gatekeepers like Sia out there, you know, <laughs> to help us make sure that our, our the people we want to see get gifted the money, get it instead, because you know, at the end of the day, we don't always agree with the larger, uh, fan base or the larger like electorate's perspective. But I do think, yeah, Jonathan wins. Who do you have for 43, Mike? So this is a really interesting one because my like gut is initially saying Jesse. Jesse has this ridiculous episode that would have just aired where he pulls off, in my opinion, one of the most brutal moves in Survivor history, using his own ally's idol to vote him out. 
he is arguably the player to beat at this moment. He does have this heartwarming story about doing this for his kids and coming from, you know, juvie to end up rising to, to make it in the world. It's something that earns him $100,000 from Sia. The issue is perhaps from like a charisma perspective to what you were defining before. Kevin, maybe he doesn't necessarily satiate that. Owen has the underdog aspect to him going into this finale that, yes, he was finally in on a vote, but he still has his back against the wall. He also has a really likable story about being adopted. Then you have Carla, who I think might have an outside chance. She is someone who, as we just spoke about, flamed really hot in the pre-merge as the power player of her tribe, as one of the biggest voices out there, as someone who had an idol, as someone who was running things, who had the stories going on. By the time we get to the finale, she is literally like broken hands, breaking her word with Cassidy. So I think she's kind of limping to the finish line in more ways than one. So I go back and forth. I think it's between Jesse and Owen, and I'm probably leaning Jesse based on what happened in the last episode. Nice what do you think, Kev? So um, I think Jesse would be my gut answer to begin with. You know, he's the big character, the complex personality, positive, using edgic terms like that. That, that that's someone yeah. who's always in the in the contention here. He's been following their story the entire time. I wouldn't be surprised if Cody could could also be there if mm. he was just voted off. And I remember people talking about the way Cody shook his hand. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end, th those are things that think about the Brenda boot, right? Like these are moments yeah. that we remember and then affects how so many people then vote afterwards. And it's like, well, you know, he was a good sport about it. We love a good sport. I think that's actually something that helps like Drea probably be in the honorable mention category in 42 because people remember also how she left with the sense of class. Yeah, but just when she got to Ponderosa that maybe that class went up the yeah. window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, there's, like, there's a few minutes of it, and that's all that the, that the, the casual <laughs> the fans footage need. is there, and that's what matters. That's the, ca right? the casual fans just need a soundbite to work off of that, of that validates their worldview. That's all they want. And, you know, I actually think that Cody being a really good sport also helps Jesse's odds Absolutely. of winning yeah. because if, if Jesse made his friend too upset, I think there are people who would have been turned off from Jesse a little bit. I, I think it would be Jesse because I think that Jesse is also someone who, from the casuals perspective, is really easy to conceptualize. He is the guy who is in juvie and he has, quote, reformed his life and is here for his family. I think that that's like a really unique story that really stands out to people. And I think, to me, Owen's story is a little less unique or like popping in a way mm. in for for casuals and to think oh, I, in a way that I think Jesse's does. And I do think Cody and Carla are both people who would certainly be in contention. I almost feel like uh, Cody, Carla, Jesse are like one party. Owen represents like <laughs> another party, a different school of thought, yeah, if you may will. Maybe Noel would be in that Owen category too. Remember mm -hmm. that she was the one who oh. had a few weeks ago who like has that amazing challenge come back, you know, the first above the knee amputee to compete. I could see like, a lot of rallying around that story as well. Yeah, yeah I actually, I think Noelle totally could be in contention here. Great points. And Does Noelle get Sia money? No, it was uh, Owen, it was Jesse, and it was Ryan who got the Sia money. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. And l I'm glad we got that one out of the way because we end with an absolute layup, right? This is Carolyn, bar none. Carolyn, I would say, despite me talking about like, well, how do we define a fan favorite nowadays because there's so many different spheres, Carolyn is maybe the first contestant I have seen in Modern Survivor to unite all the kingdoms of the fandom. Like, even Facebook, even Facebook came around and adored Carolyn by the end of it. I think we have just witnessed one of the most popular players in our time, which is so amazing coming off the hails of Taylor Hale, who is also, like, one of the most popular players of our time as well. I have never seen in the past, I'd say maybe five plus years, someone that just like has so positively gotten onto every fan that I talk to between her personality, her story, her gameplay, like wherever you're looking for in Survivor for a good time, she checks that box. And just like Kevin, you were saying, you turn to the internet after the 41 finale and all the talk in the larger community was, why did Xander not get any votes? the overwhelming majority of comments from basically everywhere was why didn't Carolyn get any jury votes? I think this is one of the easiest issuings of the fan favorite award in the show's history. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I also would say Carolyn and I, you know, my only concern of course, is that 
obviously when you think about the fan favorite award very very rarely won by women and i think that speaks again to our own society's biases who we see we want to root for and you know carolyn on her face you know as a character i i think part of the appeal of hers is that in, it's so groundbreaking that she's so popular in a way. You know, she's not the type of person we tend to root for, especially for like women or female characters. But there's something, she has the it factor. She has the charisma, the uniqueness, the nerve, the talent. She has it all. So I think she absolutely wins. But I do wonder if, again, some of those just, there's still like a vocal parts of the fan base that are, are, that are always going to be so resistant to those types of characters mm. that maybe they vote for someone like Carson, more of a, a classic fan favorite option. But I think, Carolyn does win here. And I think that's a good point that there's always going to be detractors for someone. That's just how people operate, right? Yeah. But I think what really helps Carolyn is that the other contenders here, the people who are really popular, who are very visible, you know, the two, I think, biggest contenders against her are her closest allies who she's probably taking votes from as well, right? Like, I think there's plenty of people who would have voted for Carson if Carolyn was not there and viable. And same thing for Jam Jam. I cannot tell you how relieved I was after like episode two where I read the Facebook comments and was like, oh my God, they all love Carolyn. I know. I was ready for them to hate her. Like, thank God. <laughs> yeah. You and know? so I think that speaks to like that she probably is able to, she unites all the kingdoms. She does all of all of the things that, we need her to. And, you know, I would love to see Carolyn come back. It would be so great to have her on my television again. But I would warn her, Carolyn, it will never be this good again. There is no possible way you could meet this level of love from the fan base, from the positive edit. You know, so many people come back uh, after being favorites. And, you know, we see the difference between James's uh, story yep. in China versus heroes versus villains, right? It's just really hard to have that level of positivity and reception recreated. So Carolyn, I'd love to see you in the future, but just prepare yourself. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, the, to kind of wrap this segment up, you know, one reason I think Carolyn is the fan favorite is all these fan favorites that we've named, even the ones who've actually won have in common, which is that we see the game through their eyes in particular. Mm. We see the, everyone's games through Carolyn's eyes. We're supposed to kind of be sympathetic to Carson as like the sweet young kid that Jam Jam is actually a really fun person, but maybe at times like too much of an overdog. We're, we're supposed to side with her that she's right about people like Danny and the men uh, in mm. particular. We're supposed to be sympathetic to her vision of and view of events. And I think that is always a sign of the characters. We're rooting for her group to constantly succeed. Uh, and when people disrespect her, we tend to really start disliking those figures. So I think there is, she has a lot of those qualities of the fan favorite. I'm so glad production made her, her that she was. Cause I think if they were thinking like thinking about who the fan favorite is and kind of lining them up in that way from who they expect the fan favorite to be, maybe they wouldn't concentrate on Carolyn, but they, they kind of chose her and made her the figure we're supposed to love. And they were actually able to succeed in it, which I think is why 44 stands out as a really fun modern season. Yeah. She started the very fun modern day. season. <laughs> I think that shows enough how the, the season was essentially saying it's in your particular hands go. And I think that's going to reflect well upon the audience too. Yep. So, you know, two and a half hours in, essentially, we've talked, James, we've talked to all these different fan favorites. What else do we have to kind of like finish the wrap the conversation? Just the uh, core question? Yeah, I think revisiting our question of is James the ultimate fan favorite? I think I started us off last time. So I'll get us kicked off here. I think having gone through, you know, our list of 27 through 44 of fan favorites. I will change my answer. I do not believe James is the ultimate fan favorite. I think, you join know, join us, <laughs> jo join us, Mike. I think you can make a, a really strong argument of Carolyn uniting all of the kingdoms of the fan base here. I'm not convinced that James maybe united everyone to the exact degree that Carolyn did. I will go back to a point I had made about, I think James being a back-to-back -back fan favorite in a golden era of the show. I think that James will always be one of the best fan favorites and one yes. of the ones that we immediately think of when we even have the concept of a fan favorite. But I don't think I can in good conscience say anymore that he is the ultimate fan favorite. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And I will I keep continue my position that I don't think James is the ultimate fan favorite. Um, but 
he has the audacity and the appreciation from me to always be on good seasons of Survivor, which is very mm-hmm. important to me, which yes. is one reason why he can linger longer. Yeah, he's um, uh, the reverse and- Andrea Belke, basically. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Him and Amanda. And mm-hmm. Amanda, and the secret ingredients, you know, of, of the success here. But you know, he's the fan favorite for those reasons. But I th- I will say that I think Rupert technically still is. Rupert wins the fan favorite award in All Stars, essentially. We believe he would have won in Pearl Islands. We know he's at the top of the win- of the DVD cover, unlike Sandra is. And one of the first times the winner is shoved to the side. That's fan favorite, if you ask me. Yeah. He <laughs> is in the he is the second, he's the runner-up to Russell in the Heroes versus Villains fan favorite vote. And you know. I think even in his premiere episode of Blood versus Water, where he probably obviously does not win the fan favorite there, his big moment makes Redemption Island work as a concept, which we I think a lot of super fans never even thought. And that is someone who, to me, is the ultimate fan favorite of Survivor. Though I think James, if I was making a BuzzFeed list, the top tens, I think James should always be listed there because he represents so much of what can be a fan favorite, and those qualities translate to a lot of the people we named post twenty six. So. Uh, James is not the ultimate fan favorite to me, but he is a fan favorite nevertheless. Mike, yeah. thoughts? Yeah, let's make it three for three here. I will continue my stance on no, but I'll replace the adjective. I don't think James is the ultimate fan favorite. I think he is a quintessential fan favorite. I think, mm, Nigel, yes. you brought up a lot of good points about how when I think of fan favorite, I look back and I look at James in China in particular, and I'm like, this makes sense. The same way I do for Suri, for Ozzy, for Yao Man, though like he sort of won a different award in Fiji of, okay, these are big characters who, you know, don't necessarily win, but are certainly regarded at one point as like the people to beat in their season have standout moments, RPOV characters. And so I do look to him as like a good example of what to look for in a fan favorite, including some unscrupulous qualities that we tend to look (laughs) over when it comes to judging someone's popularity. I do think what takes away from it is, unfortunately, he is relatively self-contained. Again, plays three out of six seasons. I do think there are people that perhaps prove to have more of a lasting impact. And again, that uniting of the fandoms. I totally agree with you, Kevin. Nothing I don't think will ever top Rupert Mania. Maybe Carolyn will prove to do so. But again, we live in a very different world. I would put Stephanie LaGrosa up there as well. I know she doesn't have like a physical fan favorite representation of like, Come on. She returns the next season and Lydia looks her in the eye and says, I apply for this show because of you. (laughs) Like she is far and away one of the most popular players. I do think that's something that does not help James is like, let's talk about Stephanie disappeared off the face of the earth, talking about filet mignon pizza for a good long while ends up coming back to our screens in reality TV in the past year. James Clement is one of those rare survivor players, maybe in the top seven percentile of lack of social media footprint. This dude, as far as we know, has fallen off the face of the earth. We have seen plenty of other players from that era become more of a voice on social media, even if they haven't been on the show since then. I think the fact that James has kind of disappeared from the public eye has also not helped his legacy in that the last thing we saw of him was pretty unsavory. And it's not like he's necessarily coming back and putting out funny tweets for us to get back on his side. Well, Mike, I think a a counterpoint I would make is that I have been on social media. Maybe it is best that he is not on there (laughs) today. Maybe that is helping his legacy. You never know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because it could actually tank you as well in many ways. (laughs) But I think you make such great points about James. There's a reason why he, you know, capture the hearts of America uh, for better or worse in some people's eyes. But like undeniably that's still part of what it means to be a fan favorite. And he was able to do that not once, but twice in a row. Mike, what would your reaction be if you saw the announcement of uh, the cast for the traitors Two and James Clement was a part of that cast? Oh my God. I would be thrilled because first of all, this dude will not be made a traitor as we saw from the traitor (laughs) season one. They tend to gun for the people that are capable of more deviousness because that will lead to more fun sussing out of who the traitors are. But he is going to be incredible television, almost in like a Rachel Riley way where like he's not necessarily good for the game. He won't be there to properly suss out who is doing what, but he will be loud about it. He will be more than happy to make fun of people after they vote someone out at the, you know, the little uh, summit vote that they do. And it turns out that they are not a traitor. Like he will point and laugh at them. Like he did at the villains when they got shooed away from the tribal council, he is willing to let everything show for the sake of television. And so 
I would love to see him back on my screen in any way, shape, or form. Now, look, if it turns out that he's become, like, increasingly toxic being away from social media somehow, maybe just get him out in, like, two episodes or so. But I, I love him as a character. I really do. He is such an entertaining presence that I would love to see him back on really any reality show. I would have him in a heartbeat. I can perfectly imagine James having many strong opinions about who the traitor is in their midst. And that would yeah. be really fun. Right. Uh, well, Mike, you know, we've had this long journey about James Clement. Do you have any final thoughts on James that we have not yet covered? I mean, I think I want to use this as an excuse to just keep telling people rewatch survivor seasons. This is something that, I have always been stumping for, I am so lucky to be a part of the Survivor Historians, which like gives me an excuse to rewatch and talk about seasons. I put this opinion back out when Shannon and Rob were doing their Australian Survivor rewatch last first watch. And so many people were like, yeah, it's so interesting rewatching this season because there's so many things you catch when you either don't remember it or you don't realize in retrospect what it's foreshadowing. And I'm like, yeah. That's the point. That's why we reread books. That's why we rewatch movies. That's why you should rewatch Survivor seasons. Do not just think about the ending. Don't orient your opinions about seasons towards who ends up winning the million dollar check. It's all about the journey, not the destination. And rewatching seasons again is a twofold operation. A, we only take away a handful of things from every Survivor season, considering there's been 44 of them. I bet you dollars to donuts, there's at least a handful of things you forgot about, either people, votes, moments, etc., that you can re-remember re-watching a season. And the second part of it is, look, we can, you know, rant till the cows come home about the pitfalls that come with survivor editing. But at the end of the day, there are so many fun things that exist in their storytelling, especially when you, when you know in retrospect what's happening. Hell, look at Micronesia, where... James tells Eliza to her face, you're sick, you should probably go. Eliza in confessional is saying, oh, Ozzy and James suck. You know what? Just to get my revenge, I hope they get sick and I outlast them. And it cuts to James. And knowing that he will get medevaced later on in the season, it's a little bit of Eliza's revenge, in my opinion. So I really love this series that you two have been engaging on as a way to like look back on characters both in the moment and now in hindsight. And I just want to use it as a moment to like, Stump for this idea of, yeah, you should revisit these characters, including in a new environment by rewatching some seasons that you haven't in a long time. We are about to engage in a veritable tsunami of reality TV content starting as soon as next week. But if you have the time, hop onto Paramount Plus, start rewatching some Survivor seasons. I think you'll really enjoy it, whether there's a season you enjoyed favorably at the time, but not so much now, or there's one that you completely wrote off but now really really enjoy that's vanuatu for me so i'm sure you all can find your vanuatu out there yeah beautifully said mike thank you so much for 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 saying all of those things and really kind of pitching something that we've always suggested as well which is that you know survivor is not just a game but it's also art you know it's 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 a product that is given to us to analyze to think about to that represents so many things we appreciate in our own society or are frustrated with and so the thing about characters in all these different ways is a really great great exercise and i love doing that and i love doing it with someone like you who has such a, a great um understanding and appreciation of survivor history. So thank you. And I will completely echo your sentiments, Mike. You know, I became a fan in the streaming era of the show where you're able to just mm. go online and just watch whatever season. And I think so many, especially newer fans that have found the show will like me burn through a season in a weekend, you know? And when you do that, you lose a lot of the detail, I think, because, yeah. you know, when you're on the sixth episode of a Survivor season in one day, you know, you're probably getting up and like putting away some dishes while it continues to play or something like that. And you can lose a lot of the nuances that are really fun, like the uh, Revenge of Eliza example that you were sharing. So all three of us are on the same page. Never stop watching Survivor. Throw in another episode <laughs> sometime. Yeah. Uh, well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have anything to share with folks that are listening that you have coming up? Oh, boy, too much, too much. I guess what I'll plug, I'll start with the scripted TV stuff because I am doing scripted TV content while we still have it. I'm covering over on Post Show Recap, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. I'm watching Star Wars Rebels and Battlestar Galactica for the first time as a new watcher. A lot of space lately, but then back down on Earth, it's all reality TV all the time so 
Right now, we're covering Tough as Nails, which is our sort of warm-up to the reality TV Blitzkrieg we're about to receive for the rest of the year. I've been covering that with Rob and Jess. We're at the tail end of that. But at the time we are talking, we're a little bit over a week away from the premiere of Big Brother 25. I will tease that I have a couple of fun interviews leading up to that in the week and change. And I will be able to get access to the cast bios and cast release when that ends up dropping, as well as interviews throughout the season. And then... Before we know it, look, it's almost August, and that means it's almost September, and that almost means Survivor 45 is upon us. I actually, in anticipation of my schedule getting considerably more complicated in the months to come, I've already started working on my Survivor 45 preseason interviews. It is a fun group, and I'm excited to share them all with you as I'll be covering that alongside Amazing Race, alongside Challenge USA, and of course, Big Brother as well, and I try not to lose any semblance of my mind that I have left. And you can follow all the podcasts and writings I do. I put out all out there at a Mike Bloom type on all social media platforms, wherever you may find them. Whatever's popping up, I'm going to try to like stake my claim with my handle there and then just kind of sit on it and see if it prospers. Well, Mike, that is quite a bit of stuff coming up. So I'm hoping for you that you may be able to sleep at least a few hours between now and let's say the end of December. I try to, but then James keeps singing and waking me up. It's really <laughs> annoying. You can only do so much. <laughs> and uh, Kevin, what would do we have coming up that you'd like to show? So season two of You Thought You Knew is coming to an end. I mean, it's been a really exciting ride. We have one episode left. Oh. And who else to better... Uh, discuss which Survivor legend we want to talk about than Rob Sesternino himself. Oh! Where we will be answering the question, is Rob Sesternino a gay icon? Um, which I think it'll be a really fun way to kind of think about Rob as not just <laughs> as a game changer or just as, you know, the RHAP contributor that he is, but like actually as a figure that resonated with a lot of gay fans that existed, fans like myself, and be able to talk about you know, who Rob is as a legend beyond just some of the more natural things we talk about. So um, is he a gay uh, icon in the way that like Britney Spears is? Who knows? You put him in the same breath. That's amazing. Well, Rob <laughs> famously planned a, one a season that had a snake in the logo and Britney handled the python. So they're basically exactly. the same person. Rob it shaved his head. Back <laughs> in the day, yeah, I'm becoming more and more true. I've always thought of Rob Sesternino and Britney Spears as very similar people. So thank you for, for making the comparison. Both very popular on Survivor <laughs> Sucks. I'm telling you, there is, I think there's a case here. It'll be really fun to explore it. So that'll be our next week's episode on Rob Sesternino. Um, and yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Asian Narc, which is short for my Instagram handle at Asian Narcissist. And you can find me on Twitter at Nigel Speed. So Two hours, 40 minutes in. For those of you who decided to listen through the end, thank you so much for joining us on this journey. And we hope to see you for our finale next week. And again, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure was all mine.